Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 381. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Leland, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the superior sensei of the whatnot, Segulant, and the Duke of You Know. How's it going, eh? Jim, on this episode, we are going to be talking about Batman number 27 and issue number 28. We're also going to be talking about Forever Evil number 5 and the Earth 2 annual number 2. Plus, we have a casual discussion coming up in just a couple seconds about the news about that Gotham TV show, which I'm really excited about. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network and the League of Comic Book Podcasts. Once again, sponsoring this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. I want to shout out once again the February 2014 bundle that's happening over at DCBService.com. I'm a big fan of these. Anytime you can get new titles at 50% off, it's a great way to try them. They have the brand new books, Batman Eternal, Secret Origins, Aquaman and the Others, Sinestro, and Justice League United. They're $17.95 regularly. It's 50% off, only $8.97. You know, that's $18 in books that you're getting for 9 bucks. I mean, that's just a great deal. That's why DCBService.com really is your pre-order source. Um, it's just a great opportunity to try out new titles at an amazing discount. Remember, they're a digital partner. So if you're doing digital purchases, please make sure to link your account. It's a great way to support our show sponsor. It doesn't cost you anything more to do it, and you earn 5% of those purchases towards your DCB service order. So it's a great way to save a few bucks yourself by doing your purchasing straight from their website. Like I said, it doesn't cost you anything more to do it. All you do is link your account and then click on the button on their website. It's a great way to get there. Um, we always have links up to their websites on our RagingBullets.com site, so be sure to uh, check them out and see what kind of deals they have for you. Over at InStockTrades.com, just because it was shouted out in voicemails, I, I really want to shout this book out once again. Planetary's Omnibus. I mean, this is oof, an amazing hardcover. This is 864 pages. It collects planetary issues 1 to 27. Planetary Batman number one, Planetary JLA number one, and Planetary Authority number one. Warren Ellis, John Cassidy, David Barron. It's gorgeous. It's it's a wonderful, amazing book. $75 regularly, 45% off, only $41.25. That's a lot of content for that price in a gorgeous volume. Remember, orders of $50 or more give you free shipping, and I want to thank DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Mr. Segulin, what kind of a podcast are we? Well, Mr. Whalen, we are a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on the show. So, if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. And Jim, before we kick into the episode, we, we were actually, we'd finished everything up, we're ready to do our intro, and you mentioned, hey, do you want to talk about some of the cool little tidbits we get out of this Gotham show that's going to be, uh, looks like it's going to be coming, basically detailing the origins of Gotham City and, and a young Jim Gordon, a very young Bruce Wayne, uh, and those type of things. So why don't you mention something about casting you wanted to discuss. Well, we got a Harvey Bullock, and... It's, uh, I always, I have no idea how to pronounce his name, but he's mm -hmm. from Sons of Anarchy. And I saw him on Sons of Anarchy and I thought he was a really, he's a really cool actor. He's got a great gruffness to him. He's got a strength to him. And I'm looking forward to Tim playing a younger Harvey Bullock, you know, Jim Gordon's, uh, you know, partner. Uh, his name is uh, D-O-N-A-L and last name is L O. G U E. And again, I have no idea how to pronounce his name, but I saw him on Sons of Anarchy, which I thought was a really cool show, and I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed his character there. And just, it, he's one of those when they, when I saw, you know, on the news that Bullock was cast, and I'm looking like, oh my God, I know him. Oh yeah, Sons of Anarchy. Cool. This has been. Every time they give us a cast member and they say, this is going to be who? The Penguin. This is going to be Gordon. This is going to be Alfred. And I look at the character, I'm like, okay, yeah. You know, it's usually a lot of times I go back to what I'm comfortable with, with the different movies, the different TV shows and whatnot that we've had for these characters. And I'm always worried, 
how is this going to happen? But for some reason, every time they keep announcing these new cast members, I'm like, yeah, this could be cool. Oh, yep. yeah. I, I think it's because of you know how well you know Smallville was for me, how well Arrow is for me. I'm a little bit more open and a little bit more accepting to having other characters, other styles you know, play out. So it's, I'm very, very excited for this, uh, Gotham. I want to see where this goes. Um, did you hear about the casting for Gordon? Um, it's Ben McKenzie yes. who was on that, that show. What was it? Uh, Southland, I believe. Yeah. And, um, the OC before that, uh, I think it's great casting. He looks the part. Oh God. Yeah. And with, yeah. and with his experience in, uh, in Southland, it should be perfect to carry over here. Yeah, I think this is going to be, um, again, it's one of those where I'm very eagerly anticipating what's going to happen. It's, there is a, cause, especially because this is Gotham, you know, so they got to get this right. This is, you know, when uh, Smallville first hit the scene, I was worried, like, hey, yeah, because, you know, Superman, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, this is kind of neat. But Gotham has its own persona. Gotham has its own life to it. You know, this, you know, it's, this isn't a Batman story. This is a Gotham story. And I I love just the fact that you're doing it that way. This isn't, you know, Bruce is only going to be 10, 11 years old. So he's not going to be a major player in this. I think, I don't even, I don't even remember if they, if they cast the character yet. I don't remember reading about it, but all these other pivotal people in his life, we're seeing where they come through. We're seeing how they're going to come to power and eventually how where things are going to go. I'm, this has got to have a different feel than any of the other stories, which it needs to have. And I'm very, I was like, oh, this is nice. This is good. I, I'm, you know, I'm jonesing for this one. Yeah, I am too. Uh, it's it's one of those series that I'm really jonesing for. I'm excited for the Flash series too, which is kind of um, overshadowed by these announcements. Uh, John Wesley Ship was announced as being uh, on that show. He was the guy who played the Flash in the last yeah. series. And I don't. I'm just. I'm really excited to see something come. I hope that show takes off and something happens with it, because that's always a question mark. You know, is the pilot going to be picked up or not? And and I'm hoping that it does. In fact get picked up because I'd love to see that show made. And uh, Tom uh, Cavanaugh yes. is also going to join the, the Flash cast. Uh, from He was on the TV show uh, Ed, which I absolutely loved. And he's been in a couple of different other uh, you know movies and TV shows and whatnot. So again, it's another one of those. It's like, oh, cool. I know this guy. Another one. Like, yeah, okay. Where's he going to play and who's he going to be? It's, you know, as these announcements come out, I'm going, yes. This is neat. And originally I was thinking, and this would be great if they could tie this into the uh, the movie series. And to be honest, I'm now the, the mindset, let's keep you know the TV series separate. I, I would like to see Gotham, The Flash, and Arrow all be one universe, but they don't have to be connected to the, the movie universe. Originally I was saying, I was thinking in my head, this would be great if they could connect it. And now I'm like, you know what? I don't know if I need that. Here's the, Give me here's something the, good on TV. Here's, here's, I guess, my take on it. I don't know they necessarily have to connect it, but they also don't have to disconnect it. I think there's a way you can, like, here's the great thing about Arrow. There's been a wink and a nod to the larger DC universe throughout that whole thing that connects it. But you don't necessarily have to have all of those people, all of those things on the show for it to still feel connected. Uh, if these, some of these characters from these shows bleed over to the movies, all right, I think that's incredibly awesome. I'd love to see any of them. You know, the the, the kid who played the Flash. I'd like to see the uh, see obviously Arrow. Uh, I would be happy with seeing any of them be a part of that. But if they're not, oh well. You know, what I mean, it's. Uh, you, but I don't think you need to, in the movie, go out of your way to divorce yourself from those shows. Or in the TV shows, go out of your way to divorce yourself from them. Just go on and keep doing your thing. I think there's re- it would be really silly for either to dispute the other one. Oh, definitely. I agree. I 100% agree with that. And if and I like your concept, that you know, your thought process about they don't have to link them, but they don't have, they shouldn't not link them. Just leave it out there. We got, give us a cool TV show. Give us a cool movie. Do what, you know, take what um, you have, work with it, and give us the best stuff there. It's again, it's about the story. It's about in my enjoyment. If I'm going to enjoy the movie, I'm going to enjoy the movie. I don't need to have yeah. these connections. And so, yeah, it's, I'm, again, with these TV shows, 
let's go with this. Let's, you know, not worry about getting so bogged down that we have to have this kind. We have to have this connection. No, give me something solid in front of me. And let me clarify that. The geeky part of me, which sure, would be great if all of it was interconnected. Absolutely. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying, well, Sean doesn't want them. No, of course I want it. But I don't know. I don't need that necessarily forced for no reason either. If it fits into their plans and there's a reason to connect them, even with just a cameo or something, just to show they're part of the same world, cool, that's great. If you've got a great moment for that, do it. I'm going to geek out it like crazy from it. If you do something in the credits with them, I'm going to geek out like crazy from that, too. If you don't do anything because it just doesn't fit your film, that's great. You don't need to dispute any of that either. I just I, I think there's a, just some great opportunities here. I have a lot of confidence. I don't know that I need to say any of that because I, I feel like they got a handle on what they need to do with the films. They got a handle on what they need to do with the TV shows. And I can't wait to see what happens. It's good stuff. Oh, yeah. A scarlet costume ejects from his ring. And in a blur of motion, police scientist Barry Allen becomes the Flash. Jim, actually, before we talk about comics, I, I got my DCB service box, like, right before we recorded. And it was out in the front, so I brought it in. And I'm like, we we're supposed to record, which I owe you an apology, because I... It took me a couple extra couple minutes because I opened it up because I knew it was inside. I got the Batman black and white statue, Earth 2 Batman by Nicholas Scott. It nice. Is, oh, it is gorgeous. I, don't, I, I, have, I haven't actually opened the box yet. You know, I've just seen it from the outside of the box. I'm going to do that after we're done recording. This is now the fourth statue I've gotten in the series. I'm not going to collect all of them. I'm just grabbing, you know, artists that I really enjoy. But Nicholas Scott is one of my favorite artists. And um, her rendition of... Batman, you know, that Earth 2 version, I just think is phenomenal. So I'm really excited to have that one. And it's appropriate because the first comic we're talking about is Batman number 27, which is a Zero Year, the Dark City issue. Scott Snyder's the writer, Greg Capolo on pencils, Danny Mickey on inks, FCO Placencia on colors, Steve Wan's letters, Katie Kubert, associate editor, Mike Martz, group editor, Capolo and Placencia cover, and the Scribblenauts variant cover is by... John Katz after Bob Kane. And Batman is, of course, created by Bob Kane. Actually, I want to say something. Mike Martz, um, it was announced, it looks like he's going back to Marvel. Because DC's moving their offices, I guess, from New York to California. And it looks like he will not be joining them. He's going back to Marvel, which is, I think, a big blow. Because he's been the Batman editor through so many huge events and great creative teams. And uh, sad to see him go. Dang, that's huge. Yeah, so I mean that's uh, that's some interesting news that came out this week. I want to talk about this issue in particular because there's some big happenings in this one, uh, particularly with the relationship between Jim Gordon and Bruce Wayne. Something that as fans, you know, we've their friendship. I don't want to say it's been adversarial, but Batman hasn't had respect for him like we're used to. We're used to him always looking up to Jim Gordon. This is the issue that's I, I, really the turnaround issue where Jim Gordon unknowingly is explaining himself to Bruce Wayne. And that's the part that really just captured me in this issue. There's a lot to talk about if content in it, but that was the big pivotal moment for me was that, that moment between the two of them where Jim got to tell his side of the story and how in all this corruption, he was trying to in on some level maintain a straight and narrow, which was really great. That was awesome because I remember when we first uh, talked about with the Jack and then that great scene where Bruce basically you know, pulls a gun on Gordon and says, hey, I know you're on the take. I know you're corrupt like all of them and mentions the jacket that we get the second half of the story that we find out exactly that, you know, this is still the Gordon we know. He's always been straight arrow. He's always been straight edge. And I was really happy that. We got one to see this story, got all the backstory, you know, found out about, you know, the history of the jacket, et cetera. But this was a re- these really cool moments between uh, Bruce and uh, Gordon, you know, especially because, you know, with the whole Gordon's blind without his glasses. I always question how blind is he really? Can he actually see or is he just saying that or what's the whole story? Is that his cover that he uses to, you know, to accept the fact that he doesn't know who Batman is or, you know, it's, it's always been a, a thing in my head. Whenever I see that, you know, any, every story that they've used that before, I always like, does he really, is you know he, what? does he not know? Does he know? I'm going to say yes. In this moment, he really doesn't know. 
And I'm going to say that this is the, probably the first real true moment between the two of them where everything was laid on the table. I think in this moment, Bruce completely trusts everything that came out of this man's mouth. And I think it was a moment of total honesty. I don't think he lied about anything in that moment. I think that was really what the power of that moment read to me as. I didn't question anything during that. And I know what you're saying. We always you know, have those conversations with... You know, what does Gordon know? What doesn't he know? He probably has to know because he's Jim Gordon and look at his skill set and all that. And I agree with every bit of that. But what struck me about this moment is its honesty. It felt very real. He's laying out the whole situation. And, you know, that the, we, we get to see Batman do the disappearing act. Yeah. But there was something, there was a power in that moment that I just felt was, to- I felt that was a totally honest moment. I, I didn't, I don't think there was anything that was fabricated about the whole thing. Yeah, and I honestly, I'm good with that answer, and I accept that answer. But it's it's always these are always those moments where I always have that just that moment hinge of uh, doubt and you know just that the tinge of it. And I I really like the fact that we do get this true, honest, emotional expression from Gordon. And it's you think about it, we have this Gotham detective and a vigilante, and he's basically completely bearing his soul to him, telling him. This is who I am. This is, and it's that great moment of you know you can't really call somebody your friend unless they know these type of deep and dark secrets, unless you're willing to let them in completely to who you are and what you're about. And I think that this was the the moment of Gordon sharing with uh, Batman, and this is the true beginning of this friendship between these two because they're not just partners. There is a friendship. There is a respect. There is something, and right here we're seeing the founding and the building blocks of that friendship down the line. I think for me that, you know, these were some really cool moments. I love that he references back to that he caught everything that Bruce saw, you know, and what that meant for him, meaning, you know, that was shame. Uh, you know, I, this kid saw, this, you know, and, and this, you know, this was a moment where I really had to make my stand, uh, you know, during this moment, because, it just really was it, it's a strength of character a show of character when you value so much jim gordon became a cop for all the right reasons and it means something to him and to have that constantly slighted and you see you know you get to a point where it's kind of like well how much more can somebody take how much more of that passion will still show through when you've got such an overwhelming amount of corruption around you. But we see in that moment where a child seeing this, a kid seeing this, drove him in a way that he hadn't been in a while. And I liked that. I mean, there was something about that power in that moment, and it was them coming full circle. And Bruce seeing something, you don't know somebody's story unless you're traveling in their shoes. And it's, it's a good lesson for all of us that Sometimes perception is not what things seem to be. You can perceive what somebody's motivations are, what they're actually doing, but until you see it from their side and you have their whole story, you don't really know for sure. And I loved that because it felt very, very real, very well written. I also liked that, well, it was Corrigan that was, you know, he's dealing with who um, historically has become the specter. And Mike Martz was one of the police officers. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I like tiny details like that. Winks and a nod, you know, to the editor and stuff. I thought that was really great. Yeah, and one of the things that was, I again, the art. This is a wonderful story, but it's also the artwork. This is, you know, when you do these flashback sequences, they change, you know, how the the look and the feel of the pages. And I, it's one of those where it changed, but it wasn't so glaring that I was like, oh, this is completely different. No, this is the flashback sequence, so the the non traditional panels, the you know, change in the color tones, the uh, especially the coloring and the shading and just you know the usage of which are their dominant colors. I thought that was a really cool just moments of with the flashback then in present and flashback and just how it was uh, the the groove that uh, flowed through in the early part of the issue you know we see that uh, tokyo 1946 sequence but then we flash forward to gotham city six years ago and we're seeing bruce being cut down by bullets i really loved how that came into play because 
Sequences like this in Zero Year have shown a continual evolution of his design of the Batsuit. We've seen it grow and change, and the way he's dressed has been drastically different since the start of this event. And I think we're going to continue to see that evolving of the bat suit within this process. Why he would wear armor now is, you know, pretty prevalent um, in this whole sequence of events when he's just being hammered down and barely escaping with his life. Well, and I like the the scramble. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it's um. The we find out later that the Riddler helped police plan and set up the ambush and the trap, and that's why they got him. But they were really ready for him, and they were had multiple phase attacks, and Bruce really had to scramble to get out of that. And in reality, it was Gordon who absolutely had to help him. If Gordon wouldn't have helped him, that there it would have been a. It, tough if not impossible for Bruce to completely get out of this whole situation. I thought that was a cool moment of just his realization that, oh crud, I'm I'm it's this is back up against the wall, scramble time. No, that doesn't work. No, that doesn't work. And he he was at a desperation point. I loved seeing that in a young Batman. It adds to the fact that he is prepared for everything because he had these experiences and when he's first starting off. Because he went through all these problems and had all these issues. This is why the present day Batman is so prepared for everything because he's learning from his mistakes. He's learning from his situations. And, you know, it's it's not just Batman is super cool. It's Batman super cool, but he learns from the past. And I love this the, the progression and just the growth of him as a character. Well, his only out in this one was to keep calling the cave. Yeah. And that wasn't working for him. This is the reasons why Batman would have multiple plans. And that was something that I really enjoyed. Like Everything you're saying is 100% amen true. It's, it's really the long-form format of this story. And we talked about this before when Zero Year has been discussed on the show. I really like this being a long-form story. I don't compare this to Miller's work, and I don't mean that in a diminishing way to Miller's work or to this. I really like that this has developed an identity of being its own thing that is equally valid to Miller's work in its own way. It's it's doing its own unique thing. I've stopped making any comparisons, and I don't know if you are in the same boat there, but for me, I don't read this and think of Frank Miller's year one anymore. I think of just zero year and in following this event. It's it's developed an identity. Whereas when I started reading this, the comparisons were inevitable. I need you know, that was a part of me like looking back at this era of Batman's life and, and I couldn't help but compare it to previous stories. Now I'm not in that place anymore. And I might be alone on that, but where are you at? Oh no, I'm we're in the same page. You know, it's you know, I love year one and I still love it and I still read it periodically. And when we first started this whole year zero year i was like oh man we're getting rid of something great and you you sit there and you kind of compare and now we're heavy i'm heavy into this this is you know a story that's you know one standing on its own but it's a wonderfully crafted story so it's not just you know this is the new canon this is something amazing and by saying this is amazing i'm not knocking anything that came before i'm you know recognizing that what i have in front of me is an absolutely fabulous story and it's a great batman year zero a great young batman and a young gordon and just who and what is gotham you know at this point in time when bruce gets started i i can't you know just um, I no longer pull, you know, look to the past, say, well, they changed this, they changed that. It's now focused on this is what it is. This is where we're going. See, I guess I'm, and this may be why I feel differently than other fans do, and it's not a right or wrong on that one. So this isn't me saying, well, if you don't think the way I do, you're the wrong kind of fan or you don't get this. I firmly believe in my mind how I've resolved all this is, Flashpoint happened. So because Flashpoint happened, and that was the pivotal event that changed the universe, everything before Flashpoint happened. So, like, I don't look at this as replacing those stories. I look at this as being a continuation of the universe, if I'm making any sense at all. The universe that happened before Flashpoint is in continuity. It's in canon because Flashpoint happened. Right. You know, it's not like they went, bam, we're starting at um, issue zero for everybody. 
and there's no connecting point to the previous universe. Because Flashpoint is that connecting thread, every trade paperback that's out there, every issue that's out there that was a part of the previous universe is connected through the Flashpoint event to this universe. So yeah, this is a, this is a new universe, so to speak, and we're seeing the new stories being told there, but it's directly joined to the previous universe because of the Flashpoint event. So there's a validity to the stories we grew up with, we knew and loved. They are a part of the canon still because Flashpoint makes it canon. And that's where for me as a fan, I find a, an interesting comfort level in feeling like, wow, everything I read is still a part of this. It's, it's a unique way that that event resolved what for me would be a problem. I'm not saying everybody listening to this has to agree with that. I'm not saying you have to agree with that. That's how I view this. So I don't run into a situation where I'm like, oh, they're getting rid of that or anything anymore. And and you doing that, anybody else doing that, there's a validity to that because that's how it feels to you. And that's cool. Nothing wrong with that at all. But for me, that's why I, I'm just more explaining why I don't feel that. It's because that powerful connection between Flashpoint and both universes keeps it in canon for me. That's why it works that way. It's, it's, it's an interesting, I think there's no right or wrong way to view it. Yeah, and I'm not going to say you're wrong because we look at it differently. Because I don't, I'm, I'm about the here and the now and the present. I'm about give me a good story. That's mm-hmm. what I want. And you know, for me, looking at canon, I'm not thinking that the stuff pre-Flashpoint is still canon because of the Flash. I look at it as a reboot, as we're starting over. And some of the stuff that happened is going to happen again. Some of the stuff didn't happen, et cetera. And, but I'm not knocking what I read before because I loved it. You know, and I still enjoy it, and I still will read it. You know, If I want to, I'll pull out a trade here, I'll pull out an absolute there and read it. And going forward, I'll pull out the trades and pull out the absolutes of the stuff going forward. So it's we're looking at it, we're both getting the exact same thing out of it. It just I think it's semantics on how we accept what has happened and where it goes to. I like when he went back to the cave later after he's with Alfred and he's obviously working on equipment, evaluating what happened. Up on the screen is Jim Gordon's history. Yeah. It's just showing that he's reevaluating that relationship and his viewpoint on the man, opening up the case file, his his specific case file again, which I just thought was great. This one page, though, when, when he turns over where, you know, he's talking about punishing you, how would I be punishing you? And I want to go back to that, the relationship with Alfred. I, you talked about artwork. When you flip that page, there is a very iconic moment where you see that lightning coming down. You yeah. See in the Batman suit. Oh, my God, was there power in that. And I'm not glossing over the Alfred bit because we have to go back and talk about that. Alfred telling his story and his major concerns with Bruce's motivations – he thinks he knows what's going on there. He's trying to figure it out. And he's like, listen, i got to lay this out for you. Here's where I have an issue. This is what I think you're doing. You're punishing me because of this event. Your perception of what Jim Gordon did, what I did, or what we did, even more important, what we didn't do that you feel we should have. And it's an interesting moment where somebody who's not directly in Bruce's head is trying to make sense of what Bruce is doing and giving Bruce an opportunity to start thinking through that himself. What are my motivations? Why am I doing it? Is Alfred right? Is Alfred not right? What a powerful exchange between the two of them that I, again, talking about the real exchange between Jim Gordon and Bruce, very real exchange between Jim Gordon and, uh, I mean, um, between Alfred and Bruce right here, um, who are, again, just as iconic and just as powerful as Jim Gordon. Oh, big time. And I completely, you know, agree with you on just the moment and just the power of this. And I, Alfred, you know, I'm going to say Alfred was spot on in what Bruce is doing, but I don't think Bruce is intentionally doing this. Mm-hmm. He's not sitting there going, I'm going to make them suffer. This is just, it's one of those either subconscious or it's just something he's doing and he doesn't completely realize how he's affecting other people. When you get an obsession, you get that level of intensity that Bruce has towards this, you do tend to put the blinders on and you only focus on the mission at hand and that's the strength of Alfred. That's the strength of him having Robbins with him. That 
you know, somebody else who he's got to protect keeps him looking, you know, not just so centered focus. It, you know, keeps him, you know, you know, more balanced, keeps him out there looking at the different, uh, you know, threats coming in because he's not just thinking about himself. He's thinking about the Robin. And with, you know, Alfred, he's thinking about Alfred. How is this affecting Alfred? It's it's something that makes, you know, it's something that Bruce doesn't even realize at this point in time what he needs. And I think later on we do see him res- understanding and respecting the role that Alfred pr- plays because in later issues we do get that great relationship between them, that father-son, mentor, partner type of trust and understanding between the two of them. I, I totally agree. I just want to read this, this little segment here because I just think it's very powerful. You asked me why you keep me here. And I believe it's not to watch over you, sir, but to watch. To watch you do what I couldn't. You're making us all watch, the whole city. You shut us out and punish us night after night as you go out there and protect those we can't. But if you do that, sir, if you let the past drive Batman, his scars, he becomes something dark, a demon of vengeance, not a creature of justice or hope, and he will not last, nor will you. Listen when I say, we are here for you now, Master Bruce. We see you out there and we want to help. And just, oof, that's when yeah. he, you know, that's when Bruce leaves and goes, I know where Hellfern is. There's something great in that moment because I think Alfred's on to something, but I also don't think it's the whole story. I think Batman is more complex to that. That's what I loved about it because I agree with everything you're saying, but I think there's more to that. And I think there's, there's a part of Bruce that no one will ever be able to 100% understand because you'd have to go through what he did in order to get it. Maybe Dick Grayson does to a certain extent in a way that you know maybe Alfred and Jim Gordon can't. But then there's things about him that Dick Grayson can't ever possibly right. understand for other reasons. So uh, there's, there's a power to all of that. One of the things that I, we, we kind of quickly talked about, but I absolutely have to say I loved was Gordon and the dog fighting. Mm-hmm. You know, just at those moments where you see how truly corrupt these police officers are, but it goes beyond that even. You know, the fact that Gordon had to face some pit bulls. And pit bulls are a very really tough animal. It's, you know, people talk about how they're violent, yada, yada, yada. I, I don't believe that there's anything genetically about makes them more violent. I think how they're raised, how they're trained is what makes them. But a pit bull by design, just they're natural. It's massive amounts of muscle, massive amounts of power, and especially when you look at just how they were mistreated and tortured and trained to be combat. The fact that Gordon is facing these things down unarmed, you know, is another statement of just how cool and how tough Jim Gordon is. And I thought that was a cool moment, you know, to see him fighting. And then even the added extra stuff where the the uh, the corrupt cops send a baby pit bull, you know, pit bull puppy to the house just as a little reminder to him. Hey, remember, you were able to play with the dogs. Can your kids? Can your ex-wife? Can you know the people you know and love? And I love just that those comments that were made and just how you know the dog. You know, even that great Batman scene with Batman on the wire. You see, you know, the the puppy. You know, a little bit more grown up and just you know playing and rolling around. You know, with James Junior and just the, these cool kind of just family sort of moments with that dog. And you know, that dog is a symbol of something. You know, so much more. I love. I love those sequences. The discovery that Nigma's behind the whole thing, and one of the things that I really find rich about this story, especially in these moments, are the way that Scott Snyder has taken Edward Nigma and brought him back up to the forefront as being a major villain player for Batman. I mean, in these moments, you can't help but respect the planning of this guy. Crazy, maniacal, but evil and vicious and intelligent and driven and the driven part is probably the most dangerous part of all of it because you take all those little pieces in there to varying degrees everything i just said i'm not saying all of them are is in the forefront but they're all a part of him when you see that wicked intelligence though leading to this driven man who's willing to like Batman said, thousands can die. What are you doing? You know, it's there. There was something about that moment, Batman's discovery, and the leading to the cliffhanger that was just so amazing to me. 
uh, especially when it led to an interchange with Enigma, you know, where where Edward comes on the screens basically telling him what's what. <laughs> yeah. Man, I love the when we get this type of a uh, Riddler. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny with before we even started the podcast, my only exposure to Riddler was the campy 60s uh, TV show. So it was, you know, riddles and this and that. I never really saw him like, OK, how dangerous is this guy? But now once, you know, throughout all the various, you know, incarnations of the Riddler and we get this intelligence, we get this nasty level of evil that is just absolutely brilliant. You know, it's I love this type of villain. Again, it's the intellectual challenge for Batman, but it's also the physical level. He can't throw the same type of punches. He's not that kind of physical, but he's going to lay the traps. He's going to make it, you know, very tough on Batman. Do you know Batman's going to have to be on his A game to get through all of this? And I love seeing that level of villain who can keep up with uh, Batman. You get that stuff with the great Joker stories. You get that level of equality with the, some really good Penguin stories. I love. You know, Batman needs to have these type of villains. Batman needs to have intelligent villains who, if life had just been a little bit different for them, you could see that Nigma could have been an ally of Batman. He could have been a great ally if, you know, Nigma had gone a different route. If, you know, any of his, you know, rogues, if they had just zigged instead of zagged, you know, maybe Batman would have an ally in Gotham instead of this great adversary. Do you want to talk about issue number 28? Oh, yeah. Um, next discussion will be Batman number 28. The writers are Scott Snyder and James Tinnan IV, with pencils by Dustin Wynn. Anchor is Derek F-I-R-D-O-L-F-S, Friedelofs. Um, colorist uh, John Klatz, with uh, Sal Cipriano as letterer. Uh, Dustin Wynn on cover, with uh, Howard, Ch- Howard Chaikin and Jesus Alberto. And the variant cover, Katie Kuber is the associate editor. Mike Marks is the group editor. And, of course, Batman was created by Bob Kane. And apologies to people that I am butchering their names. Um, Sorry about that. (laughs) Now, this issue is a side story glimpse into the future, where Batman's going. Um, We don't know how it gets here. We're jumped into a time frame that's just labeled Gotham City Soon. And it's a preview of what's going to be going on in books like Batman Eternal. Now, how we get to this point, I have no idea, because we're jumped into a drastically different continuity. I love stuff like this. I will admit, when I was reading it, I was like, what the heck just happened? (laughs) Um, But I also say that in a good way, because I was glued and captivated to it, because I was reading all the way through going, Um, there were times where I was uncomfortable. Because I'm like, what, 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 what now? <laughs> um, but there's an excitement there, too, because I want to see how we get here and what's going on at this point. Um, what were your impressions? Like, what was your experience like reading this issue? I'm so glad because you and I didn't know when we discussed throwing this issue in. Um, I knew that this was going to be the Batman Eternal prelude issue, you know, or preview kind of issue. But I didn't know what that meant. So we walked into this pretty blind when we thought about doing this. What was your experience? Um, I missed the Gotham soon note on that first page. <laughs> so I jumped right into this. I'm going through this. I'm like, holy crud, you know. I'm thinking this is exactly immediately right after 27. So I'm completely going, wait, what? Wait, <laughs> He doesn't have a partner yet. Where's this going? And I went through the whole issue thinking, okay, then I'm looking at the new at the costume, and I didn't read the cover. What? You didn't read the cover? No. (laughs) (laughs) I just jumped right. Um, I've had this issue digitally. I didn't get it. The, well, I have it now, paper, because my box. But I, I have the digital. I have the digital issue as well. It's right there on the cover. Yeah, I know, but I just jumped right into it. That's fine. You know, it's yeah. I didn't stop and look, and I was like just going ahead first, and I'm reading this <laughs> issue, and I'm about halfway through, going, "What the heck is going on here?" Because. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you know, obviously the costume, he has his modern costume. We get a uh, bluebird. We get all these things going on. I'm like, huh? And I was just like completely freaking <laughs> out. And I went back to the beginning and I started reading Gotham soon. I'm like, 
oh, okay, <laughs> okay, this is present day or future present day. Like, okay, all right. And as soon as I got that, my hands around the fact that this isn't continuing right after where 27 left off, I'm like, okay. Now let's see. And then I reread the issue and rereading the issue. I was like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is great. And I was like very, very excited, you know, going forward, knowing, you know, what the, where this took place. I was, too, because, I mean, we're in this for some big changes and we don't know how they happened. And that's something that I'm excited about. Um, what do you think about Bluebird? I mean, let's talk about that. Harper Row, we, we knew from the teaser image a while back that she was going to be developing an identity, and there was some speculation that she might be becoming the new Nightwing. Well, we know differently now. Now she's Bluebird, which leaves up in the air, what is Nightwing? Is Nightwing going to be Nightwing, or how is this going on that end? What do you think about the identity of Bluebird? I was very excited. Yeah. Yeah, you know, especially once I realized that Bluebird didn't precede Robins, because that was the first thing I'm thinking. Because I got all the <laughs> way to there before I went back, because I was sitting there reading. I'm like, Bluebird, what? Bluebird preceded Robin, and I'm like, what? You know, so that's when I went and started rereading again. To you didn't realize this was out. Harper Row. I, you know, that was the other thing. I was sitting there, I'm like, because I thought that's who it was. I'm like, okay, that's Harp. Wait, but he did. He meets her in the, you know, and I was like, really confused. You know, obviously, as I'm talking about, you know, not realizing my time zones. and But, you know, once I got my head on it, now I'm figuring out what it is. What? I like it. I really like the fact that they didn't go with Nightwing. They didn't go with another Robin. You know, Robin died with Damien. I'm happy and glad that they're doing it that way. It kind of, you know, again, it's a respect thing towards Damien. You know, and the fact that she's not a Robin, she's Bluebird. Well, you know, here's, and, here's the other thing. If you read that issue, I'm not convinced she's his sidekick. I don't know that she's necessarily... We might be following another operator in Gotham. I don't know that she's his sidekick. And she does make mention... I'm still... She does make mention of what? That she was trained by some sidekick. So she may be her own operative. Mm -hmm. Bluebird may be her own separate entity. And she just, you know, is... She's part of the Bat universe. Right. So I don't know. I don't know that she's necessarily going to... I would have no issue if she does become the new sidekick. Uh, But, you know, he says, you've been training. You can yell at your sidekicks later. That could also mean that he hasn't been necessarily approving of this. Because we do see that in her previous appearances. He isn't so thrilled about all this and not sure what role she should play. Um, This is also a guy who, after the loss of his son, who was his sidekick, may not necessarily be looking to take another one on. I'm also not convinced that we aren't getting another Robin. And when I say another Robin, I'm there's part of me that's I'm 50-50 on this. So I'll admit, you know, I'm I'm not sold, but I think there's a pretty good possibility that Damian story that we're seeing right now might go somewhere. You know what? I'm I, when they first killed off Damian, I I was I was hurt. I accepted it. I moved on. I went through the stages of uh, you know, the stages of death. If they were to tell me a really cool story to bring him back, I'd be happy. If they were to take, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, spoiler, make her the new Robin, I'd be happy. You know, it's again, I trust this creative team that we have. You know, and if they're going to say this is where we're going, I'm going to sit back and let them see what happens. I like the fact that Harper is more involved in the universe. I like the fact that Bruce never wanted her to to step into the role. You know, it's one of those things with when you become a vigilante, when you, you know, go into this world, if you continue on, even though you're not being encouraged to do it, that tells you something about their level of dedication. You look at with uh, when they told the stories about Tim Drake, how Bruce kept trying to throw roadblocks and stop him and didn't want him to do it, but Tim kept pushing forward and kept going through it. It showed Bruce that there was a level of commitment that Tim had to the cause. With her, with Harper, every step of the way, Bruce and you know Batman is trying to stop her from doing this, trying to you know push her, not encourage her, keep her from you know following this. But she keeps pushing forward. Why? It's because it's her passion, it's her fire, and you need to have that in a hero. You need to have that level of commitment. So the fact that this is you know she's continuing on, and again another ex, you know really cool reason why she's got the Bluebird identity. That's her personalized identity. It's not a Robin. It's not a Nightwing. This is who she is. I love that because it's, it shows her dedication to the cause. I agree. I agree 110%. 
Uh, here's the thing. If it becomes Batman and Bluebird, I have zero issue with that because I really liked what was going on in this issue with them. I'm very confused as to how we got here. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes this is a great example of where confusion is sometimes a good thing. Now, to be fair to you, I knew from solicits that this was going to be a one-off issue. So I walked in knowing all of this. So if you didn't walk in knowing it, I could see where your confusion would be greatly magnified. So I walked in knowing this was going to be an issue, jumping to Batman Eternal, not realizing the drastic changes that are coming our way. That's something that I was like, what, wait, what? what?" (laughs) Uh, Very intrigued along the way. Yet, it's a very interesting thing how when you take a jump like this, I was intrigued, I was captivated, and lots of times I was uncomfortable and weird and leery. And all the like great emotions that you should feel in a situation like this. And I'm still that way, going like, wait, how did we get in what? And what, what does this mean for this character and that character? And where's Dick Grayson? <laughs> you know, all the questions that I have spinning through this, this is how you do a teaser. Because... They answered sort of some questions. Like, we we know what's going on with Harper Row now, which I think is great. Um, We get a little idea of what the status quo is going to be, but there's so many things that are not answered by this of the other people that operate in Gotham. We don't see any of them. Fantastic choice. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, and it was funny because seeing who the boss of boss is, I didn't... You know, that was, again, was another surprise for me. Even though you look at it with the Egyptian theme, with the cat god themes and all that, I should have seen Selena being the, the big boss. But, again, didn't see that coming. Loved the reveal and loved how they played out. But this whole bit with sending in Harper as the... Um, you know, the undercover operative, mm-hmm. you know, get her initial going in. And that's, you know, just I loved, you know, again, it's weird seeing Bruce trust somebody. But whenever he does let somebody in, whenever he does trust people to do this type of stuff, it makes you feel I'm like, yeah, all right. You know, there you go. Team dynamic, the team bad. But the entire time, you know, Bruce was there and the entire time Bruce was keeping an eye on her. And when he needed to step in. Boom, he's there, takes out the bad guy. So those are some cool moments. Again, some great Batman suddenly hits you moments. You know, there's a different relationship there between them, though, in the sense that he was able to rely not only on what you're mentioning, bird high, bat low. They're yeah. having, they've got a shorthand going on between the two of them that is revealed there, which is interesting. There was no wasted motion there. Her answer was, got it? Yeah. And and it just flowed. I thought that's fantastic, but it also leads to the question, what is this relationship? Is it closer than maybe maybe I'm wrong in my I might be wrong in some of my assumptions here. Um, which I quite like. Yeah, I'm taking it my opinion is Dick Grayson trained her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, that's where I, I'm getting it. Because when you look at her costume, there's it has a very nightwing esque feel to it. You know, and you know, especially when she says, you know, you can yell at your sidekicks later. But you know, more than Dick Grayson, then Tim Drake's involved in this. I'm Jason uh, Todd Jason, as well. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. she's going with gunplay. Mm-hmm. You know, because I even like the, you know, again, you know, Batman not using guns has always been a, a, a pivotal thing about Batman. Well, but she does. So but sidekicks. stun guns, stun guns. Yeah. There's there's a key to the type of tool that she's using. She's using that tool, but. She's using it in a way that doesn't violate the code. I really liked, and I'm agree. This isn't me disputing you. It's agreeing with your point, but there's that added element of a yes, she's doing this, but, and that's what separates her from Jason Todd. And I like that. Yeah. Oh, and and I I definitely think we have all of the uh, all of the ex Robins and Red Robins probably even Mm -hmm. have something to do with her training. Because you you just see the flow and the motion of just how it's these two are in sync and they know exactly what's going on. I love the fact when she does when she does go high and the boots catch the little the, the little clip thing on the bottom of her boot that catches the line and she's hanging inverted firing. It was a really it it looked like a Dick Grayson type move to me. I could see Grayson doing that, but then you got the gun, so you got Jason Todd. And you got the tech and the hardware where I'm seeing a little bit of Red Robin coming. So it's, there's a whole, like, the whole gang seems like they're involved with her. And it's, again, 
Is she a sidekick? Is she a partner? Is she another operative in Gotham? I don't know. But I want to see where it goes from point A to get to this point. I want to see this the, this evolution of this character. I'm very excited, very thrilled to, you know where this is going to go to. Now, the whole bit with Catwoman, first of all, I couldn't agree with you more. I felt like such a dunce when I saw it was her. Yeah. Because I'm like an idiot. It was like... They couldn't have broadcasted more. <laughs> they should have put Neon Lights Catwoman. I probably still would have missed it. Uh, when I finally saw that it was her, wow. One thing I like about it is powerful and sexy, which you want from Catwoman. It takes her in a direction that it hasn't been done with her in a while, where she feels like no longer a background player. She's a major player, if that makes sense. You know, where she's like, okay, this is Batman's flame that he had a fling with. She's a cat burglar. There's something about her where she's been kind of in that category where she isn't where, like the Riddler, what we were talking about with the last issue where the Riddler was up high up here. This puts her up there. I don't don't know if you understand what I'm saying. It bumped her to a level of foe for Batman, and it's more complicated than that, because they they have this love, hate, uncomfortable, weird relationship. It doesn't throw anything out the window with where she's been previously, but it reminds us that she is an opportunist who will take advantage of a situation, and there's something in that moment when she's standing there with him. I felt for the first time in a while like they were equals in a way that I don't normally feel with her. If that makes sense, I usually expect him to come in and rescue her. Yeah. Um, In this one, I really felt a sense of power emanating from her that we haven't seen in a while from Catwoman that I really quite liked. It was another facet of the personality and I don't feel it takes any way or diminishes anything. I don't know that I, I, and I'm, I don't know that it's fair to call her a bad guy in this. I don't know what she is. I'm intrigued in the story to see what her status quo exactly is in this moment. But it felt great. Oh, God, yeah. And and you talk about just powerful moments and just powerful female characters and just these moments between her and Bruce where you see the real power play. She's got the whip cracked around his neck. He's literally on his knees in front of her. And Bluebird steps in with the rifle. But even that isn't the end of it. The true end of it is the fact that Bruce asked her. He's like, hey, all you had to do was ask. You know, because of their relationship, because of their past, because of that, you know, cat and mouse dance kind of game they've played in the past. I love seeing these two characters Mm -hmm. because it's, again, she's that same, we talked earlier about the Riddler having that massive intelligence and just that evilness that makes him a great, you know, Batman villain. Catwoman has that same type of, you know, strength and intelligence that she fits in Bruce's world. You know, she makes sense to be in Bruce's life because of the strength of character. And again, it's, I, you know, I was really excited seeing how this goes. I want to see where, how Selena gets into this position, how she gets to her point of power, and especially where this is going to go in the future for these two. And is there going to be something even more coming out of it? I loved the Stephanie Brown reveal. I was like hooping and hollering. First of all, I love the fact that her costume, while it is a a New 52 version of sorts, I'm going to put quotes around that, it really looks like the classic spoiler outfit. Great moment there. I'm anxious to see what this means for her, what she's going to be like in this whole universe, what the relationship between her and Selina and Batman and Bluebird, even more so, is going to be like. Be interesting to see if her, her and Bluebird become friends. You know, maybe the relationship is her friendship with Bluebird now instead of the relationship she had with Tim Drake before. Who knows what that's going to look like? Or a combination of the two, because before we saw her have a relationship with the uh, Cassie, the for, the former bad girl. Yeah. So to see her now in this role, it's it, she brings a whole new dynamic into the sequence, and I, I can't wait to see it. Oh God, yeah! And again, I'm a spoiler fan. Mm. You know, I was really happy when, after you know, when they brought her back and just how they're using her as Batgirl and everything that you know they did with uh, Stephanie. I'm glad to see her in here. But again, another wonderful tease as to what's going to happen. I'm very excited for Batman Eternal. This was a great teaser and a great glimpse into that series i was looking forward to it. i was like oh okay yeah that'd be kind of neat but i wasn't excited about it i wasn't like oh my god i gotta see where this is going i gotta know where the virus is what it is how does stephanie play a role in it because she's the only one who knows you know how you know how to stop what's coming next 
How does she get that knowledge? Where is it coming from? What is her role in this? It's There's so many questions I want answered. And it just, this is how you do the teaser. This is how you get people excited. And, wait, you give them these tastes and teases. This is a tease to a weekly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, tell me that isn't exciting. This oh, is going to yeah. be a weekly book. Like I'm, I'm very, I'm with you. Every your excitement, and I'm like giddy with it, just like you are. Uh, the one thing I really like is the, the powerful part of this. This is a weekly book, yeah. And I can't wait to see how that weekly book turns out. Th- this was really, really a well done issue, where um, it left me. I'm still very mixed in my emotions, and that I'll, I will add back in. There's that uncomfortable emotion that's there too when you've got a, a hanging status quo. Where you're like, what? How do we get here? In that moment, you can't help but like sit there and go, whoa! And obviously, this is spinning out of Forever Evil. You yeah. know that the the status quo. I can't wait to see what gets us here. I really can't. Very and, well done. And it's funny. I'm now looking at the cover once again, and it says right there on the cover, a secret glimpse into Batman Eternal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I. I am an idiot. Okay, I no no I no, blew no right past it, dude. Dude, here, here's where. First of all, I knew that ahead of time, so I don't know if I wouldn't have been in the same place if I hadn't uh, seen the cover and that little blurb. But I, I knew, walking into the issue, I knew that this was going to be the case. This was a one-off issue. It was a very different place. But I also share. I didn't know it was Catwoman. (laughs) Like, how do you not see that? Like, can you argue that they didn't put enough symbolism and imagery in there for Catwoman? They called the place the Egyptian, so I'm like, oh, okay, it makes sense. They would have all the cat statues, you know. And I, I wasn't even thinking. I wasn't thinking Selena. I was. I didn't really even know who it would be. Part of me was thinking, you know, are they going to go with the the King Tut guy? Or they had a couple different Egyptian people. But I was actually thinking it was just going to be some mob boss, just you know, and have an Egypt feel to it because that's used a lot, you know, especially like with casinos and gambling and this, you know, the Egyptian type of theme to it. It it was absolutely wonderful reveal. There it is, going into that tunnel. Our next chat is going to be about Earth 2, Annual Number 2. The uh, title of the issue is actually Origin. It's written by Tom Taylor, pencils by Robson Roca, and apologies for any butchery there, inks by Scott Hanna, letters by Desi Cienti, colors by Pete Pantazis, a cover by Rags Morales and Brad Anderson, assistant editor is Anthony Marquet, uh, the editor is Mike Cotton, and the group editor is Eddie Berganza. And again, apologies for any name butchery there, because... This creative team deserves to be applauded from the cover straight on through to the end. This is something I requested uh, to do. I, I said, and you, as <laughs> usual, being the team player that you are, you're like uh, probably jumping on board because you hadn't read it yet when I had requested it. And um, wow, what a powerful, powerful issue because this is where we find out the origin of the Earth 2 Batman. Who is he? And we should say the second Earth 2 Batman. So we finally get that reveal there. What did you think about that? Let's just say it. It's Thomas Wayne. What did you think about the reveal? Yeah, If you had told me that it was Thomas Wayne before reading the story, mm-hmm. I would have been like, ah, man, I was kind of hoping it was somebody not Bruce or not related. or you know, I, I, I would have been less excited about it. But seeing how and why and everything that played out with it, I got to say, I love this. Mm-hmm. This is a great this is what you do with alternate universes. You tell the bad story, you have it be connected, but changed a little bit. And this is why you know, I really enjoy the, the Earth 2 concept as well as this, this title. Because we're getting these characters that we know, but there's little twists and little turns to them. And you know, and by the end of this issue, I was like, oh my God, I love the character. I felt bad for the character, but I was excited. And, you know, I, you know, the differences between him and Bruce and how he's going to run Batman, but he's still going to honor his son. I thought those were just some great stuff. And I was, I was all in, I was 100% back in this guy. I want to see this last for a while. I love that. There's a tie to our man with the drug. Yeah. Because the drug that he takes is a direct tie. And um, the addiction from it is something that's part of DC mythos as well, because I believe it was the second Hour Man, it was the son of Hour Man, who had, I, I believe, an addiction due to it. And forgive me for throwing that out there. There, There is, let me jump back a little bit, there's an addiction element that plays into it. Also good for Arrow fans, 
who are dealing with the same drug right now yeah. on that show and the addiction qualities of it. So there's a whole bunch of connecting threads with this storyline where it connects to people regardless, and I love that. The reasoning behind the dad's motivations and really how the dad messed up, uh, made some mistakes when he was younger as a doctor, rescued a, a gangster, and then all of a sudden made this decision to sell drugs to him. And then when he had a family and had to make a decision, the decision he made was to try and get back on the straight and narrow for the sake of his son. Because now you're looking at my, your legacy and, and are you going to bring your child into this or are you going to teach them a better way? A different angle for the death of the parents. I like that it wasn't just, this is the exact same origin story for, the, for Batman, Bruce Wayne. The origin story is drastically different, but his motivation comes from that. And seeing how Batman reacts to it was powerful. It's just a very, very tight story from that end. I, I really loved every aspect of that. Oh, God, yeah. And it's funny because you mentioned the Miracle when they first had it in the story. And I'm sitting there and I'm you know, reading it and he's talking about how it only lasts an hour. I was only thinking Arrow. I was only thinking current Arrow. I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. And then, but then as they're talking about how it only lasts an hour, I'm like, wait, an hour? You know, and then it took me like mo it took me a while to remember our man and remember his drug and I remember reading some of the stuff with him being you know him being addicted to it and I remember going you know pulling up getting you know past issues and reading some stuff and you know so that it took me a while to, for the for the for that connection to him so that was another thing for me it was like as it's going through I'm thinking one thing and then by the end I'm like oh yeah oh cool and I did a couple quick googles and some searching around etc but that was a, a neat moment for me that you know again second and third read throughs I got a little bit more out of the story and got a little bit more out of you know just the the secret behind the the drug yeah absolutely now artistically speaking these opening pages with the death of uh, the parents were absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. This was the heavy blue and heavy shaded focus. You know, the fact they get that great look of, you know, just sadness, pain on Bruce's face and even Joe Chill, just the, the way he, the, the, the sleazy look he kind of has to him. I thought these were just some wonderful sequences. We've seen this story multiple times. We've seen the death of his parents multiple times, but every single time, you know, each artist and each creative team puts their own little taste to it, their own little little spin to it and i gotta say how much i love the this take on it especially the fact they did heavy blue focus except for the blood you see the blood splatter you see the blood coming out of thomas's mouth and the pool of blood on the ground i thought those some really cool accents of that red in there in the field of blue was absolutely wonderful as batman's case takes him more into his family history and he starts exploring it more. It leads to his first confrontation, not knowing it was his father, the thug under the mask who was so powerful. He was able to throw Batman around. <laughs> you know, I mean, very rich moment there. Because um, we're dealing, and when I say throw Batman around, it didn't diminish Batman at all. It just showed that he's not dealing with an average thug. He's dealing with somebody with uh, superior strength, adding to the whole drug aspect of it, which I thought was really great. I had absolutely no idea it was going to be the dad when they were saying jarvis pennyworth i thought yeah. okay maybe it is the butler that he's going after i don't know what was leading me because we knew that this was the guy explaining the kind of man you're following i did not in any way shape or form take this that this was going to lead to it being dad and yet it made so much sense his shock and all this is the world's greatest detective we know this about batman and that's true on this world that aspect of this, he didn't see this coming. He didn't see that his dad was still alive. Oh, God, yeah. And as this is playing out, again, we got some great detective moments from Bruce as he's you know, when he's first going after you know, Joe, when he's first going after Joe Chill with he's looking at it and he's breaking this guy down going, wait a minute. Maybe he's not just this petty thug. Maybe there's something more to Joe Chill. And I love how he is slowly piecing them together. To the point where he goes after Falcone and he's, you know, questioning him and it just everything leading through. I love seeing great detective moments from Bruce and, you know, that's a must in any Batman story. You know, so we get these cool moments because this is a different Earth, Brett. This is a different Batman, but he's still 
the same guy. He still has that same connection. He still is the greatest detective. I loved just, again, seeing how that played out. I love seeing that he continued on as Batman in spite of this. Because he basically, you know, he says, everything I, I was told, everything I was believing was a lie. Uh, my whole mode of operation was a lie. And to come back and have to face that and then and then to come out the other side and go, you know what? I'm still Batman. I'm still going to do this. Wow. It was powerful. Yeah. And it's funny because on one hand, I sit there and I'm like, you know, with uh, Bruce not forgiving his dad and just I understand the pain. I understand the anger. But you think about it. Your whole life, you thought your dad is dead. You find out he's not. How can you really stay angry at him? Now, you got a chance to have your father back in your life. And it's, you know, the stubbornness and just the level of, on one hand, I want to smack him. On one hand, I want to say, dude, you're being given a gift here. Take advantage of it. But on the other hand, I understand his anger and I understand his pain. So it's it's a tough call to make. Now, do you know who Rex Mason is? Because um, he re- references that his old friend Rex Mason. Yeah. Do you know who that is? Yeah, that's... um. Oh, God. Uh, element guy. Yeah. Metamorpho? Yeah. Yeah. That's It that was kind of cool that it went that route on it. Um, again, showing that there are people in this world. But then we sh- switch to present day, and when we see him with the, with the mask off and finishing off the story and, and seeing what happened to his son and having to deal with that, to be that haunted at, at his age. Yeah. I understand Bruce's be- feeling of betrayal. And not having the ability to come to terms with it. That's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, if I wonder if Batman had lived, if they would have reconnected. I, I would have I imagined at some point in time, maybe. But what we know of Bruce on our Earth, that wasn't going to happen in one meeting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that it certainly was a grudge that Batman would hold for quite some time. Especially when, think about how driven he was to dedicate his life to being Batman because of this. To find out everything he put himself through, to get to that point was based on something that was a lie and that at any point in time his father could have corrected that but didn't would have to be something that would hurt you and be a slap to your face i just i thought that was really really terrific yeah um again it's one of the reasons where i have a on one hand i understand what bruce did on the other hand i'm like ah come on dude especially when they're showing those sequences where the, you know, Thomas is watching his son. He's seeing Helena get born. He's seeing what he does as Batman, seeing what she does as, you know, Robin, and just everything he's been through watching this you know, on the sidelines. I, I got to think that Bruce knew he was there the entire time watching, but he just chose not to acknowledge him there. And that's, I was like, dude, what you doing here, man? It's, you know, it, does he share with uh, Selena that his father's still alive? Or did he never tell anybody that it was you know, his dad? You know, where's the level of what did Bruce reveal to Alfred? What did he reveal to anybody else? Who knew that Thomas Wayne was alive? Who didn't know? And that's, those are the questions that just, it, it's ripping me apart trying to figure out which way it went. Because really, this Batman's a completely different entity. He's a different person. We can make assumptions and guesses how he would react. But in the end, we don't com- no. And I have two minds about this. It's funny, when we had Jim Calafuri on, he was talking about how sometimes it's better to leave the fans imagining what they think yeah. those answers are. And I could see this one being either way. I would love to read the story, yet I like the speculation as well. Uh, there's something rich to that. So it's, it's really something where it's up to creators and writers. I got to tell you something. I was very worried about this title when James Robinson was leaving because of just how well he crafted it. This Tom Taylor is hitting a home run. It's hard to follow that up because, you know, James Robinson did what he did pretty perfect. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and and for another guy to come in and put his own stamp on it while honoring what came before and doing it like this, just really, really terrific, well-put-together stuff. Oh, God, yeah. And it's funny because... This you get a story like this, and you know, okay, I'm I'm getting comfortable with this creative team. I'm getting comfortable with this guy, and that's always for me. If I'm comfortable with the, what they're going to do, what they've done, you know, I'm a lot more open. I'm a lot more okay. This is going to be good. When it was first announced, Robinson leaving, I got really scared just because I loved what Robinson was doing. I'm like, ah, no. Yeah. But you get a story like this. You get a story that has me thinking so much off page. 
that tells me this is something that pulls me in. This is you know somebody who gets these characters, and they create they craft a story that I enjoy, and they craft it the way I enjoy it. And there's so many different stuff that have like Jarv- uh, Jarvis uh, Pennyworth, you know Alfred's dad. That again, the character was so massively cra- was so masterfully crafted the whole time. I'm thinking he's got to be the new Batman. He's got to be the Batman. And even you get those moments where, you know, when they tried to send a gentle message to Thomas Wayne and, you know, the message wasn't proper, properly received. His man saw to that. The guy was a psycho. And you see Jervis with the, the two collapsible batons just completely decimating some people. I was like, this guy has to be it. And all the way up until the big reveal, I was thinking it was going to be um, – Jarvis the entire time and that is something just like yeah even going back and rereading the story I'm like where is Jarvis what's he doing what's he up to is he still active is he still around in this universe I don't know I want to know all those answers as well uh, this is really really there's so many characters in this earth too like I love that Lois Lane's the red tornado yeah uh, I want to know more about hot girl uh, there's just so much more in this series that they can delve into it's really really well crafted and i was particularly worried about this one because of how much i was enjoying it that i didn't want it to lose or, or skip a beat and oh <laughs> that's the yeah. farthest thing from what's happening here you know it, it's funny with um second and third read throughs and just everything that happens i gotta tell you there's a scene when bruce plants the tracker on um on his father mm-hmm it wasn't until probably like the third read through that I actually saw it. I just figured they didn't. Ian, it's very clear in a panel when I'm looking at the page right now. You, know, you can see clear as a bell that he put it on there. But when I'm reading this, I'm following the action. I'm seeing the scrambling. Yeah, I just assume Bruce put it on him because he's talking about you know tracking device. You know where is he headed? And you know Crime Alley. You sure? I'm like, oh, going back to Crime Alley, of course. You know, and and just everything that's playing out. I never noticed that little piece of artwork, and it's something that's kind of a cool. You know, when you you go through and you catch these things it's I, I still get a oh look cool moments i totally agree with you uh it's it was one of those issues that i read over and over again that's been pretty consistent with this series for me i've done a lot of rereading of earth 2 just for the pure joy of it um it's just a very fun well-crafted world and i'm glad to see them continue it i can't wait to see more of how this when this world eventually interacts with ours oh god especially when this, you know, this Batman reacts, you know, with our Batman, mm-hmm. you know, because that's something that how will he handle it? How will he still be around? Who knows? He's you th- this is a great character and I don't want them to get rid of him, but he is living on borrowed time. He is older, but he's basically strung out on this drug that's keeping him going. It's, you know, you know he, he can't last long. He's going to burn out and. You know, it stinks to say because it's a great character, but you know, in reality, if you look at just think about this, there's no way this guy can keep going for long. And I'm wondering if when he crosses over, if that's when eventually, you know, the two universes are going to cross over. You know, eventually there's going to be a meeting. And part of me thinks that the crossover is where the death is going to happen. And he'll get some, you know, some closure with our Earth's Bruce and our Earth Bruce, Bruce will get some closure with this guy. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's one of those uh, closures. I don't know if closure is the right word because I can't help but wonder if that's going to be more complicated than that, too. You might be right. It may be that type of moment, and I would be perfectly fine with it. But it could also be a whole other interesting mess. Another neat point that I I was glad they did was Leslie Thompson. Uh Uh-huh. You know, because, you know, he gets shot. He's in the hospital. He survived the attack, but he's able to convince one of his doctor friends to let people think she's dead, let people think he's dead and, and get him out of the hospital. I thought that was a neat moment because he, all he says is Leslie. I'm like, it's got to be Leslie Thompson. Cool. Again, another character from the Bat Mythos they're bringing into it and another character who's associated with the Bat family doing little things they shouldn't be doing. I thought, again, another neat part of the, the story. Leslie Tompkins is probably one of my favorite Batman characters of, uh, like, the animated series. She was around before that, so I don't want to say it was just the animated series. But when the animated series was going on, she, in the comics as well, started into this role of being kind of a mother figure to Bruce, 
where, uh, or, or grandmother, or whatever you want to call her, in the sense that she, like Alfred, had this ability to tell Bruce what's what, to talk to the real person. And there's something to that. Uh, when, when the whole spoiler thing went down and Leslie Tompkins was kind of ostracized, that was the one thing I hated about that was that she had so disappointed Bruce that there was almost no coming back. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think she's just an absolutely fantastic character. And, and to see her used in such a different way in this was something that made sense because it's a different world. That attention to detail that you're pointing out is something I really love as well. Bring in the supporting cast, have some great attention to detail there, and it really works. Our next discussion will be Forever Evil number five. Jeff Johns is the writer with David Finch as pencils, with uh, Richard Friend as anchor, Sonia Obach as colors, Rob Lay letterer with uh, David Finch, Richard Friend, and Sonia Obach on the cover, Ethan Van Skyver and Hi Fi for varying covers A and B, with Evan Reese, Joe Prada, and Rod, Race, uh, Rod Reese on uh, varying cover C. Katie Jury as the assistant editor, Brian Cunningham, group editor. Superman, of course, was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster by special arrangements with the C- Jerry Siegel family. Jim, I forgot to hit record. You're going to have to do that again. Serious? No. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I do creative teams, I'm always like, ah! <laughs> Because I did that one relatively good, I think. <laughs> as always, we never want to insult creative teams, no, but especially we, yeah, with this one. Because mm-hmm. the this is, I'm so in love with Forever Evil that it's unbelievable. I absolutely think this has just been an absolutely fabulous, amazing, you know, just series that lived up to the hype that I had in my head. And... I'm so it's and again it's not just a wonderful story being told the the creative the the inking the penciling the coloring everything that we're getting through for um you know for this has just been absolutely just spot on yeah yeah it's uh, and and everything that's connected to it from the outside from the mini series to the event that's going on in the supernatural books uh, they they're enhancing and just adding to this making it feel like a much larger experience but i love that when i read the forever evil issues that they they feel very much their own thing um that are that's having amazing impact i'm glued to the characters inside it and i want to see what's going to come next with them in the kickoff of the story, we're seeing Power Ring versus Sinestro. <laughs> Did you at any point in time, because I ran into a point where I'm like, is he actually going to be able to beat Sinestro or hold him off? Because there was that one part where he like hulks up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, for lack of a better way to put it, I'm like, is it possible that Power Ring can take down Sinestro? I don't know if you went if you went to that place at all, but I was so enjoying that battle because it went different than I thought it was going to. Yeah, you know, if you remember last time we talked Forever Evil, mm-hmm. I said we're going to get I, – I was betting on we were going to get our first death of the syndicate and it was going to be powering by right. Sinestro's hand. <laughs> and I held on to that the entire time. I was loving it. And part of it is because how much I love the character Sinestro so much. He is one of those – great villains for me so i but i love the fact that powering was fighting back then there was moments where i'm like okay looks like sinestro is going to break a sweat here because at first i'm thinking he's just going to wipe the floor with them then they give these moments that give you the impression okay sinestro is going to have to you know throw down have to do something no he didn't really he's sinestro this guy was no match for him whatsoever, and I loved. But I love the fact that he does have that flare-up moment. It, it's kind of like when you're watching, just you know, you think about uh, years ago in the Olympics, the Dream Team, you know, the original Dream Team that was just decimating everybody. If you think back to some of the games where it, there was a little bit slower play in the initial beginning, they're like, "Hey, wow, are we going to get somebody who's going to actually give these guys a challenge?" Nope, <clears throat> and they completely wiped the floor. It was those type of moments I had with Power Ring. Those the split second moments, I'm like, "Hey, maybe Sinestro's going to have to work for this." No, he didn't have to because he is Sinestro. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's one of the great things about Sinestro is there's certain points in time where it just is he is Sinestro. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just what you expect from him. I really, really love that. Now, 
with Power Ring, I like that the ring was basically telling him, you got to stop screaming, you're going to get us both killed. Yeah. You know, you need to start getting it together and wish to be the most powerful because if you're not, we're done. And I, I love that that turned into a battle. Sinestro looked fantastic, though. I really loved the visuals of him with the parallax-style suit yeah. and just how great it looks um, being on him. Uh, it just really is... Uh, it's funny how that character just continues to evolve and remains one of the most interesting villains. Because I remember him being kind of the... As a kid, I always thought of him... He was Hal Jordan's bad guy. He almost looked like he was just missing the top half to be the mustache-twisting guy tying people to uh, railroad tracks. Yeah. And how he's evolved and been really imagined to the point where going back to probably who he was originally supposed to be, going back to the original creators, they've really evolved him into a true foil for Hal Jordan, which I've really liked. And just the the, the fight sequence that Powder played out. Again, you see just the level of the coolness that is Sinestro, mm-hmm. you know, chopping off the arm. And you know, the ring going, that eh, host is irreparably damaged, scanning for new host, jump, and disappears. And you know, Power Ring's got that moment of bliss. It's finally gone. Thank you. You're welcome. Whoosh. <laughs> I, I shouldn't cheer and laugh at someone being completely disintegrated, but again, it was great Sinestro moments where you knew it was going to happen. You knew it was going to come down. It wasn't going to be a happy, happy joy moment for this guy. Sinestro was going to finish the job. It's really, really great. I, I love seeing the team-ups between uh, people like Captain Cold and Black Manta, even though they aren't best of friends afterwards. You know, like life, this alliance is temporary, Captain yeah. Cold, which, which fits their relationship. The whole time that Batman's involved in this, though, the fact that he's, they're sort of fighting on the same side, but he's not convinced. It's really an, I don't even, alliance is not even a good enough word because what's going on between Black Manta and Captain Cold is an alliance. And it's an alliance that could end very quickly. But with Batman, this does not feel at all like an alliance. And that was the nice thing about seeing Batman's moments framed by what was going on with those two in particular, to see how drastically different his role is with this particular group in the mo- at, at the moment. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I thought, again, was cool with these Batman moments, mm-hmm. you get that Captain Cold moment where it's like, you know, in the light of day, he's not so scary. You know, it's you, Captain Cold wouldn't have any normal dealings with you know, Batman. He wouldn't have just a regular occurrence. So this is something new for him. And I like seeing the fact that he's kind of, you know, looking at things differently. And even, as you mentioned, that the dialogue back and forth between him and Manta. I like seeing that type of stuff because that is, you know, you know, more like the Captain Cold style. He is a team player. You see it with the rogue. Somebody that he thinks, okay, this is a kindred spirit to me. I can maybe form a trusting here, maybe a little bit of an alliance here. And I like seeing just how everybody's playing off each other. Wait, that Captain Cold bit, though, I want to go back to that real quick, because you're leaving out a critical part of that line. You know, Batman's not so scary in the light. I mean, ever. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that was really great, which means his perception of Batman has been, this is this really scary guy. And uh, (laughs) he had to justify that at that moment, which was awesome. Well, and actually, yeah, I could see that. And again, um, the Catwoman Giganta type of stuff that was going on as well, where she's like, hey, you picked the wrong side. I liked, again... Catwoman's recognized as being a thief. She's recognized as being a villain, but they do know about her connection and her association with Batman. So no one was really surprised on what side she was on, but they're like, hey, you messed up here. I like the Batman bit where if we're working together, I'm in charge. (laughs) Uh, Batman, they're in charge. (laughs) Especially when you see Bizarro, Luthor, a floating Sinestro. Uh, we got Black Adam and Deathstroke standing there. We have to talk about Deathstroke. Because, oh my gosh, was that one of the best bits in this whole thing, where Deathstroke's originally against them, and then decides to, because of Luthor's dealings, <laughs> join in with them. 
It was it great. It makes sense. Oh, yeah. It's a good deal for him. And I love the fact that you know, you get these cool you know moments between the two of them. You got Deathstroke's got a gun to Luther's head. He's like, hey, what's this? You build this armor, but you leave your head exposed? What? Your arrogance. And I love just that he's playing the mind games with Luther, but the entire time, Luther wasn't sweating it. Mm-hmm. Luther knew he had him exactly where he wanted. He needed to sit down and just have that conversation with Deathstroke because first and foremost, Deathstroke is about the deal. And it is a better business deal for him to side with Luther than to him to side with the uh, syndicate. I thought that, again, those were some cool Lex Luther moments where he's able to make himself look like he's vulnerable. But the whole time in my head, I'm thinking, okay, Luther's got this covered. I don't know how he would do it or how he would protect himself, but he's got this situation in hand. What he did in that moment, though, was show Deathstroke respect. He didn't play any games. He didn't try to swerve him. He laid out the facts for him and said, hey, look, I know uh, totally what you're all about. Here's the deal. This isn't good for me. It isn't good for you. Think about your business dealings. How are these guys going to be good for that? And Deathstroke having to realize that it was just really a powerful moment. Lex Luthor recognizing that you can't handle every person the same way shows, again, another sense of intelligence to him. That's where, in that moment, that was not about ego at all. That was totally about Lex just knowing who he was dealing with. Yeah, it's again, that's one of Lex's strengths. But it's it's weird whenever I see Lex kind of take a more a non a non alpha male moments. Right here, he's being very submissive, being very you know, and I don't want to say weak because he's not, but it was kind of if he tried puffing out his chest, if he tried pulling an alpha male move on Deathstroke, Deathstroke would have pulled the trigger. So he had to sit there and think, okay, I've got to look like I'm not a threat. So he can hear me and listen to what I got to say. The, this battle is one with intelligence, not brute strength. Mm-hmm. Same thing, you know, with with uh, dealings with uh, Sinestro, getting Sinestro to join in the team. Like, hey, you're a leader. Think about how this would go. You're the right person to lead this team into victory. And he's playing, catering to Sinestro's ego. He's catering to what Sinestro needs to hear to stay in the game. I thought those were some classic Luther moments where. Luther is the puppet master manipulating the strings and just having everybody dance the way he wants it to go. Yeah, and that's that's where this starts to get really, really interesting is when you start seeing the interaction of these characters and them all realizing they have to handle each other a little differently. Uh, Black Adam. It's funny because as he, he's got some cool moments in here, but it's whenever they have him quasi-speak that I remember, oh, yeah, his jaw is shattered, and this guy is still on his feet, still fighting. It, it get, it's something that does remind me how cool of a character he is and that he's able, you know he's in constant pain. It can't be easy on him, and it's got to be just, especially even when he's calling down the thunder, when he's calling down the lightning, you know that just reverberates through his body, and it's like just shaking him to his core. And I love, again, seeing him stand up and him knuckle up to the challenge at hand because he needs to. And this is even a younger version of Black Adam. This isn't the Black Adam I'm used to who has been time and time again proven to be a really hardcore tough guy. This is relatively new into the game, but... He still has those those key moments that is Black Adam. Yeah, and that's a key. It's you know, with the new fifty two, the the best characters have been the ones where if you advance them and do something new with them and, and take them forward, you also don't lose what was the original draw to them. Black Adam has been one in recent years who I think has has had the best opportunity, especially since uh fifty two of being reimagined and reawakened and and used in just a a really, really cool light. And in JSA as well before that. So to see this character resurface and and be brought into this kind of realm by Jeff Johns, who really was the architect behind that with JSA, is really great. (laughs) Because he's just a, a great character. And him being able to play Sinestro and Black Adam together is going to be something that's really, really powerful because of his handling of both of those characters. Now, how do you think, how do you think Bruce is going to deal with the fact that he is partnering up with people who will take a life? 
They're not going by his code, and they won't listen to his code. We see that with uh, Deathstroke taking out um, uh, Copperhead and even Bizarro taking down uh, Blockbuster. I'm not 100% bro- certain that Blockbuster's not um, you know, still with us. And those were, again... You know, right in front of Bruce, he had to, you know, and he can't really tell them, hey, well, he can tell them don't kill, but they're not going to listen to him. I don't know. Uh, and that, that's going to be a really very difficult decision for him because you have to maintain your alliance because the evil that they're facing is much greater. But can he take that? And I don't think, you know, I, mean, I think it's going to be very much what you're predicting, <laughs> a very, very interesting presentation. And when do they turn on Bruce? Because mm-hmm. you know it's going to happen. And once, is it once the Justice League returns? Is that when, okay, time to turn on? Do you wait until after the crime syndicate gets defeated? When do you turn on the good guy? Oh. You know, that's, you know, again, it's, I love the fact that these, you keep thinking about this stuff. And, and from day one, I was thinking we were going to get, you know, once we saw that Bruce was still alive, that he wasn't trapped in it, I was thinking, okay, Bruce is going to uh, lie himself with this, you know, this Injustice League, and he's going to, you know, actually work with them. But the whole time you're thinking, there's going to be the turn. There's going to be the turn. There's going to be the double cross. When's it coming? And it's the anticipation of it is something that, you know, like, this is neat. <laughs> Ultraman with the reveal at the end that the creature that was coming from them, you know, the creature that destroyed their world has come here now. Now, uh, I'm under the impression that's still dark side. See, on one hand, I'm saying I agree with you, but something's telling me it's not dark side. Okay. And I don't know who the creature is, but you think about it, you know, when dark side hit before it wasn't, you know, that kind of, the sky was red and all, there was that blood and death and all that, but it was the boom tubes, it was the openings, it was the thing, I, I don't, the, the cut across the universe, you know, kind of that, you know, that uh, cut into it, I don't think it was that, you know, so it's, I'm thinking we're going to get a different villain. The color's, or different, the, the color's right, though. The color's right, but how it came about. I, you know, I'm trying to remember from, you know, that first, you know, um, from Justice League 1 when they actually showed up. And I don't remember it being that type of, this looks more like a rip in the fabric of time. Whereas the others were boom tubes and they were opening and they were transports and stuff like that. And it wasn't until they came and landed and set up towers and whatnot that we got the, the red sky. This looks more like a cut in time and space. So it's like, I don't think it's dark side. I think it's going to be something else. Except in order for him to get to so many worlds, wouldn't he be, have to be able to do that? Because he gets to other timelines. True. He went to Earth 2. We know that. He went to our Earth. We know that. Right. So I don't know. And yeah, I, I, I guess, let me, let me clarify something. Let me backpedal for one second here. I don't know that I'm, I'm not really saying that I feel you're wrong. I feel that Darkseid's a strong possibility. I'm not digging my heels in saying that he's the only possibility, though. And when you're throwing out that it could be a, a new villain or a reimagined version of a classic villain, um, I I can see that very heavily as well. So um, it's more of I'm justifying anything I'm saying is more of justifying the possibility of Dark Side yeah. than saying that any of that means that you're wrong. Because I don't think I don't think anything I said there disputes your thinking either. Yeah, and it's you know again. If it's dark side, that's cool. There's plenty of you know, thing, and it would make sense. And I'm looking forward to seeing that because you know, dark side's a great villain. Yeah. But there's just something in my head that's you know, and and, and part of me sees this as maybe uh, the bleed, something coming from the bleed or coming that way. You know, one of those characters, maybe someone like from Stormwatch or one of the the villains they've dealt with. I think that would be a kind of an interesting way to go with this. Tilt your head to the left, then tilt it to the right. Okay. That noise is what's going on. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) You know for a fact I did what you said. Because I'm looking at this last page. I'm like, okay, maybe there's some optical illusion that I'm missing. And I'm looking and I'm totally going to like, okay. There are times I hate you. You know that, don't you? I couldn't resist what you were saying. And it's the thing that's going on in my head. I'm like, oh, I've got to have some fun with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
what's great about this story, though, is the an- the sense of anticipation. I don't know who's under the hood yet. We're going to find that out next issue. The fate of Dick Grayson, we're going to find out next issue. Those are blurbs that we're hearing about with what's coming next. Um, this reveal of who this big bad is, whatever, or big bads, uh, what well, he refers to a creature. That's the interesting part. Would he consider Darkseid a creature? I don't know. Uh, and that's the part that I'm intrigued by you know what is this that's coming this is going to be a great wrap there's two more issues great wrap up to this story there's a lot to wrap up in this story do we hear anything about the last issue is it oversized or i don't know and that's a you know how are they going to put all this together that's the thing i do i do question that i do wonder that but again with this creative team i'm completely comfortable with it i know it's going to go through i know what's going to i know we're going to get this so it's it's weird because i'm curious i'm excited i'm wondering what the heck's going to happen if it was anybody else i'd be nervous but you know what we're getting is some amazing stuff so it's going to continue and i hope it is oversized because i do like you know i do like when they go out with a bang and this story we have to have the Justice League get free. We have to have the big fight between the Justice League and the crime syndicate. Plus, we got this other big bad coming through. So we've got a couple fights coming down the line. I agree. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about this is the we've seen, like, this issue had chock full of all the fights that we really wanted to see start playing out. And there's more. Yeah, and Plus, especially you think about um, we've got Cyborg who's getting rebuilt, I'm mm-hmm. assuming. We've got... Wait, 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 hold on. Did you say you're assuming? Yeah. Okay. So you're behind on some of your reading. Yes, I am. Okay. So, and it's, again, it's, again, more of the the fact that you talk about how these other titles that are connected and associated. So it's, let me guess, the Justice League of America has got some interesting reading for me? Yeah, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, because, um, that, that, yeah, you just, you've got a lot of reading coming. All right, well, let's let's actually talk about that. When there's big crossover events like this, and you've got mini series and things like that, you know we have life and things that go on. Um, I know for myself that there's a, a couple of books that um, like I'm a little bit behind on Forever Evil Argus, and of all the crazy things, I'm behind a couple issues on Arkham War. I've got to read four and five, and none of that is a slight on those books. Just my schedule's been crazy, so I just haven't had a chance to get to them yet. You know what I love? I got a couple issues of both of those to read. And I'm yeah. very excited for the material because it's a great story. So I don't mind. I guess my schedule lately has been very different with my new job in particular, where there's times where books will get stockpiled. And it's sometimes it's the best reads that I'm reading. They just end up getting stockpiled because maybe I'm getting caught up on something else that had already been stockpiled before. I kind of like it. Yeah. I, I'm enjoying like sometimes reading a couple issues together of a series and, and really enjoying that experience that way. Sometimes some books read better two or three issues at a time. So I still like the opportunity to have the monthly experience, though, out of those titles. Oh, God, yeah. And you just found, you know, with me, I'm behind on all of the Justice League titles. Mm -hmm. Justice League, Justice League of America, and Justice League Dark. And I still was able to completely read and get into this the story that's coming down the line without knowing what happens there. And same thing with um, Argus. I'm one issue behind. I still have that that issue of Argus. I've my schedule has been absolutely insane lately, and I've got very little read time. <laughs> and it's yeah. You know, hopefully, I'm going to be able to you know do some catch up this weekend. That's my plan to get so some you're, reading. You're not caught up on the the story that's going on in Justice League Dark Constantine um no. and the both of the Trinity of Sin books. Pandora exactly. And, I'm behind on those. Oh so my I got, gosh, is that I know. good? It's really really good. It, and nothing against those. I was no, no, I excited to read them. I just mm-hmm. life gets in the way sometimes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's um I think I think it's a testament to how these events are being crafted now that you can read them that way. I, I quite like that. I, I think I always read the Forever Evil book right away when it comes out because it's the big event piece. So I like to jump to that right away. So I've never felt like in reading one of those issues that I was missing inherently a, a, a part of the story because I was behind on, on one of the minis. I'm not behind on everything with Forever Evil. There's the other books I'm, I'm very caught up on. Like the, I'm into the Supernatural books, so I've maintained caught up on each one of those issues as they come out. But um, the minis I've gotten a little bit behind on because I was maybe getting caught up on another book. So it, uh, it's fun. Yeah, usually I grab the 
the Forever Evil main title first, and that's what I read. And then after I read this one is when I pull out, you know, Justice League, Justice League Dark, etc., and all the other ones. Because I always, I always want to make sure I get the main title in first. Because in case the other ones give any details or any surprises and spoilers from the main, I want to make sure I get that main story in. Because, again, the way they're crafting this, you don't need to read the other stuff. The other stuff is extra added, you know, goodness. But, you know, this is laid out so that you get the full story, you know, just from, you know, uh, Forever Evil. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Really a terrific, terrific event. Hey, one quick question for you. Go for it. Bizarro. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, this is definitely a variation of, you know, we talk about how more every more and more as it's going on, I'm really digging this Bizarro. And then, you know, I never had a any type of passion or, you know, connection to the other Bizarro. So for me, I can say very easily, this is kind of my Bizarro. You know, I really like how this is going. What's your take on this Bizarro? How are you feeling about him? Well, Luther crafting a Bizarro was something that was done back in, I think, Burns Run. That was done once before, and I quite liked it. This is, I think, a building on that concept. Um, I I like what he's done here with this version of Bizarro, Um, so my hat's off to him on that one. Um, Again, I want to clarify that this this feels very fresh, but just that concept of that type of Bizarro has been done before. As is usual, when Jeff Johns does something, he does it with a Jeff Johns flair that makes it fresh and original in and of yeah. itself, especially in the interactions between Bizarro and Luther, which I think are really the key to the character. Because we see Luther start having more of a respect and intrigue to him, whereas he very much dismissed him in the beginning. Yeah, it's the uh, it, well. This is his version of his crypto. This is his dog, and I, I like the I like seeing that uh, relationship grow and just that the loyalty, the protection that Bizarro always is going to have for Luther. We saw it early in the, early in this issue when um, Blockbuster's throwing the punch, and Bizarro stepped in front of Luther and took the punch. You know, Luther didn't have to tell him, "Hey, do this." Bizarro was doing this on his own, and even when Blockbuster, when you know, Bizarro finally did take down Blockbuster, he looked to Luther, saying, "Yeah, this is okay, boss." He's like, "Oh yeah, good boy, good boy." You know, I, I thought those were some really cool moments. Yeah, and I, I actually felt like Luther was almost worried for him. I would say yeah, but not. I, that's, see, why, I, that's why I remember I started with almost. Yeah, it's. In a way, yes. I don't think he Luther has an emotional connection to him. Yes. Because Luther doesn't have that, but Agreed. Luther does recognize what he brings to the table. I agree with you. That's that's actually an excellent way to put it, and that totally matches what my thing that's why I said almost. Yeah. Like there there was there was some sort of um difference there that I think he would have been earlier with him. And uh but certainly not on that level. You put that very well. <laughs> and again, that's the wonderful crafting of Luther. You know, they, these, this is the Lex Luther I like. Uh huh. You know, he's not some maniacal monster wanting to take the, over the world. He is Earth's greatest champion in his own mind. And he knows he's the best man for the job. And we're seeing how he's protecting Earth. We're seeing how he's doing what the Kryptonian couldn't do. And how he, and again, he's the puppet master. He's got everybody doing what he wants, and he has them thinking they're in charge. Mm-hmm. I love that about him. I do too. That's very rich for the story. Yeah, this has been a really terrific read. You won't get away from me this time, Buster. Hi, Sean and Janet's Jack from Michigan. Just want to see what you all thought of uh, Sex Comics number 27. And if y'all have been uh, reading the uh, Parker novels, well, excuse me, adaptations by uh, Darwin Cook, and also called to also see if y'all would want to see what y'all would, y'all think of uh, maybe uh, Warner Brothers slash DC Comics actually putting into the byline eventually before we die uh, Bill Finger's name into the uh, created by byline for the Batman. Uh, just wanted to see what y'all. What your all thoughts are all on that, and also letting you guys know too that uh, the HeroClix game thing is going to be doing a War of Light special event for I believe starting in June, June to I want to say maybe next year in January or something like that. Um, the War of Light event, just like in the comics, except they're going to have um, 
like special boosters for it and stuff. You can collect like all of the different lantern core, the green, yellow, orange, blue, red, violet, black, white. If there's any I'm forgetting, sorry about that. I also throw that information you guys' way. Um, and I also pulled us what y'all know that you guys are show rocks and uh will do a great job every week and uh happy uh birthday yet again, Sean. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, I'm glad you called about Detective Comics. I've been digging that. That's that Gotopia arc that's going on right now. And if you're not reading it, um, the uh, the premise behind Gotopia is it's the Scarecrow bands together with other villains and uses his drugs and you know his his way of uh, manipulating the mind to make everyone believe that Gotham is a utopia. Everyone's perfectly safe, and you know the. Even Batman has like the life that he never could imagine. He's still Batman, but he and Catwoman are partners and they're in love and and they actually accomplish things in Gotham and, and Gotham, you know, his crime rate has dropped down drastically. And anybody who's a power player in Gotham believes in this utopia. And his premise is if we've got people, including the people in power, believing adamantly in in the utter goodness of this place when you bring fear into the equation it's going to hit them that much more and it it increases his exp- his experimentation with fear he gets to take people to a level that he's never been able to before because of Gotham's nature so it's really a cool concept and it it bleeds over into some of the other batman titles like batwing catwoman and batgirl and stuff like that and it's kind of cool to see how gotopia plays in in all of those different books um, so it, it's a fun story. I, I'm digging it right now. Um, it's uh, Detective Comics is one of those books that it it, lose, it gets lost in the shadow of Batman, but I'm really loving it every month. It's been a great read. I've been digging that book. Um, and I would actually say that with the whole Bat Family line, I think it's really a great time to be a Batman fan. Like, I don't have any expendable Batman books. You know, anybody who's writing in the Batman family is really just doing a fantastic job. Not just the books featuring Bruce himself, but, uh, you know, Nightwing, Batgirl, I mean, Batwoman. These are just great titles that I'm, I'm loving every single month. So it's, it's just a good time to be a great fan. A lot of great talent involved in those books. And uh, Detective Comics is a great example of that. John Lehman, I know he's leaving the book. But um, he's one of those guys that um, I hadn't been reading a lot of his work prior to this run, but uh, this got me into his own work, Chew, and and I'm a big fan now, <laughs> and I do highly recommend Chew. You mentioned Parker with Darwin Cook, and um, if you haven't read Parker, um, Parker's not a DC publication, but um, Darwin Cook certainly is a name you should know if you're a DC fan. And uh, if you like detective crime noir style stories and you haven't read Parker, do yourself a favor and pick that up. It's just, it's gorgeous artwork. It really speaks to Darwin Cook's strengths and there's a lot of passion in the creation of Parker. You can tell this is something that Darwin Cook really wanted to be involved in. So it's definitely a a great project. Bill Finger, you know, he's one of those, I actually got the, uh, there's a book, it's a, a storybook actually, and it's done by Mark Tyler Nobleman, I had to just look it up. It's uh, I've got it right behind me. It's called Bill the Boy Wonder. And uh, he did, uh, a, few, a few years ago, if you've been a long-time listener show, we had him on the show to talk about his book about Siegel and Schuster. And I was glad to see him do one on Bill Finger because of his role in really in the background of Batman and in the creation of Batman. It's very interesting when you talk about um, the amount of people you know, Bill Finger is certainly one of those people that whose name should be synonymous with Batman. I agree with where you're going with this. What I'd like to see nowadays is kind of, uh, especially with digital and the fact that there's digital extras, whether you get the paper comic or you get the digital comic, and obviously it's easier to do this in digital comic. I would like to see a like links that are associated with major titles where they have the amount of creators because Certainly, it can be argued there's a number of creators whose names should be attached. And the history of what they've brought to a character should be connected to that character. And I think it goes beyond just the original creators now. And and I don't mean that to diminish the role of Bill Finger and Bob Kane. I mean to, we should add to that. 
there's a lot of people over the years that have added to the mythos and expanded a character, and they should be acknowledged. That should be part of history, almost like creating a, a virtual Hall of Fame, where that link would be available in the comic book. You know, hey, for further information, check here. And, you know, it would be just like a history of the character and the creators that have been attached to it, and almost kind of like a growing Wikipedia done by the company where, you know, this is a great way to acknowledge people that have been associated with the character. And it, from a financial standpoint for the company, it would make sense because what you could do is, under that listing, some of the masterworks done by those creators and have that associated. I'd love to see that nowadays. You know, I, obviously in the digital book, it would be something you could tap, you know, and would take you to a website and say, hey, if you haven't had a chance, pick up these books. But I don't want it to just be pointing you to graphic novels it would be a history you know when did the creator first start working on the character what were the major accomplishments maybe a little bit of the person's history i would love that because i'm into comic history and I, I would also be into reading about people who maybe when i was a kid growing up you know had touched it and today you know I, i'd love to know from be able to click on a creator's name and and get to know a little bit of their backstory so that's some stuff I'd like to see done more in comics, uh, which I know goes a little bit outside of what you're talking about. Should Bill Finger's name be up there the same way Bob Kane's is? Um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I, I just, I guess my point is with a character like Batman, there's so many names that I think should be up there now, including Bill Finger. And uh, that's a very controversial topic because, you know, Bob, there's, you know, do you believe that Bob Kane was the one that created did Bill Finger create him? Um, I think both had a major role in it. And I, that's why I think it would be great to just be able to look at the whole character's history and really acknowledge everybody who had an involvement. Um, I think throughout comics, uh, there's been creators whose names maybe we don't know and recognize. And I would love to see that be a growing advantage of being like a digital extra where over time that could continually be added onto through maybe company input, through fan input, um, to really, you know, create a, a serious acknowledgement to people who have had a role in the history of these characters. And I think from a company standpoint, for any comic company, that's why I'm, I'm not being specific to DC, I would say this in general, I would like to see more of this being done. It would make sense because it's a great way to point people to your product <laughs> and say, hey, you know, now you've gotten to know this person through this history we put together, why not read some of their work and actually see, you know, what they did. So, I don't know, that's kind of, that's my dream of what I'd like to see from it. Uh, just because I would like to be pointed at things that I missed and, you know, get to know some of these people. But I want the history of the person in there. You know, I'd like to know a little of their backstory, a biography, a mini biography, a little extensive biography. Um, great to eventually add video clips and different things like that. You know, whatever's available, you know, uh, that you could, you could add to it. Um, I think it would be something that would just add a kind of, uh, you know, community aspect, a greater attachment to uh, the comics and, and the people that create them. But that's that's kind of my thought. Uh, this is Jack. Uh, this is Jack again. Um, okay, I gotta agree with you guys that the Green Lantern titles have been fantastic. Pretty much all the Lantern titles have been great. But um, there was one thing I was wondering about. First off, I heard that they're gonna move back the Superman Batman movie to 2016. This doesn't really bug me because they moved back Man of Steel and it was great. You know, that, that helped it by moving it back. And I don't think Superman and Batman need the strike while the iron pot theory because they kind of make the iron pot. The only Superman movie that didn't make money, according to Box Office Mojo's numbers, is Superman 4, The Quest, Quest for Peace, and all the Batman films made money. So there is no reason to think that Superman and Batman, just by moving back, will, you know, it'll hurt the sales. I actually think if you move it back and you make it better, then that's all you need. Now, as far as what I'm uh, calling about was, one, I want to wish goodbye to the Suicide Squad because I heard that's going to be canceled and that's bad. But um, I am definitely geeking out about the fact that DC Comics is supposed to do the lead-in to the Godzilla movie that's coming up and being a huge Godzilla fan, mixing that with DC is just like a dream. And uh, finally, the other thing I had was on, and this is where my question comes in. Now, I heard that Amazon is going to be canceled. I saw this on Newsarama. So um, they said that they were not going to proceed with the show. So it's not canceled because it never actually came out. But I started thinking about this. 
one time a, a couple of years ago when I was at San Diego Comic Con at a DC panel, one of the writers mentioned that DC doesn't like to have two live action versions of something out. So they don't want a live action movie while they're having a live action TV show. Um, I don't know if that still holds, but I remember Mark Andreessen, I think, was the one that said it. And if that's true, and Amazon got killed in the cradle, so to speak, maybe it got killed, and I hope this is the case, but maybe it got killed because they're thinking about a Wonder Woman movie franchise coming out of this Superman-Batman film. And uh, what would you guys think about that, a Wonder Woman movie franchise instead of a TV show? I mean, and plus, what do you think about the idea of having two live-action versions at the same time? Uh, I don't really see a problem with it. Do you guys see a problem with it? And finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about, I'm sorry this is all so long, uh, I saw a rumor that the reason for uh, Batman Superman being moved back is because it's going to be filmed simultaneously with Justice League and that David Goyer was going to write Justice League. Have you heard anything about this? Is this true? Anyway, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll never be this long again. Uh, great show, guys. Always. Talk to you later. Yeah, the Superman-Batman release date, I heard that that was a possibility, too, that it was being bumped back. Uh, it's, it sounds like my experience is kind of a lot like yours. I follow you know, a lot of the things that pop up on the net. I think we all have to take rumors as being just that, rumors. Um, some of them are going to be true. Some of them might be based loosely on truth, on things that might be going on behind the scenes from the film. Um, you know, we'll, we'll hear official release dates when we hear official release dates. My feel, feeling with film, and even television, is that don't release it until it's done. Um, we've seen when things have been rushed out, and that's usually when fans are dissatisfied. Release it when it's finished. You know, if you release me a great, well-done film when it's done... Um, I'm going to go see it, and I'm going to be thrilled, and that's going to be the thing I'm going to watch over and over and over again. I'll buy your merchandise. I'll you know buy like eight different versions of it because you release the original theatrical release, then you release the Super Mondo director's cut, and then some crazy box set that I have to have for some strange reason that I can't fathom to this day. But um, you know that's it comes from the passion of this was a great product. So if you give me that, I'm I'm fully on board. So that's what I want. I want that from Superman Batman. If I have to wait an extra year for it, I'd rather wait an extra year for it than get something that's less than satisfying. So I'm assume I always assume when if there's a production delay, there's a good reason for it. I haven't heard anything about it being tied with Justice League other than Justice League rumors pop up constantly. And I could see it being something where they want to maybe use the extra time to get a Justice League script going. So maybe they can do what they're doing, something a la The Hobbit, you know, where they would jump right from Superman, Batman into filming Justice League. So that way that you could go off the hype of Superman, Batman, build into the hype of Justice League and really give people like a one-two punch where, you know, Superman, Batman comes out, then maybe the next year Justice League comes out if they do it that way. So I don't know, but I haven't heard that. That would be my assumption if they were to do something like that. That's why they would do it, to try to bring them closer together to connect them in some capacity. So that way there would be an ending in Superman, Batman that would somehow lead to a Justice League film. That would make a whole lot of sense if the story makes sense to do that. But, you know, I'm thrilled if Superman, Batman is its own contained movie and doesn't necessarily lead directly into Justice League other than some winks and nods. And then there's a great, satisfying Justice League film that's independent of it. You know, obviously the same connected universe. So I don't know. I don't really have a preference either way on any of that other than if it's great, I'm glad. (laughs) That's all I really care about. But, I mean, that's what I would suspect if they were going to do that. Suicide Squad, I'm sad to see that end, too. It's a storytelling reason, though, so we're going to get something spinning out of it, uh, you know, with where everything's going with Forever Evil. It looks like that Forever Evil is going to be a shake-up that's ending certain things and building to new things, so we'll see, because uh, there's a lot of uh, Amanda Waller in the story alluding to what she wants to do next, so I think we're going to see that play off in the universe proper. Um, as we go through. Maybe we'll get a new Suicide Squad book out of it or a new status quo for something like that out of it. Uh, I am i didn't know about the Godzilla thing, actually, until you mentioned it. I'm a big fan of comic book movie lead-ins, um, more so than adaptations, even. And not that I'm anti-adaptations. I like adaptations. But one thing I like about the lead-ins um, or side stories are its original product set in the movie universe. So anytime they have stuff like that, I'm on board, especially if you attach quality people to it, which seems to be happening more and more these days. Those tend to be something of substance. 
And so I, I like that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'm excited too. Um, just I sometimes I find out beforehand that those things are coming out. Sometimes I really realize after I see the movie that wow, hey, there was this this product that I I could pick up uh, that somehow enhances my film. And I, I'm a big fan of that. It's swag. It's, comics become swag then. I always look at that too as an opportunity if they use it right to get people reading comics. You know, that's that would be a comic that you want to make sure to hit the film goers. You know, your Godzilla fan that's going to see the film, letting them know, hey, if you read this comic, and you know, maybe that'll get them to read more comics that are in that genre, because there's a lot of stuff in the sci-fi um, horror genre that um, I think would f- be great for a, a film goer who likes Godzilla. The two live-action version things, well, they did it with Smallville and Superman Returns, so I guess um, I've always been puzzled by that. I kind of get the point, uh, I mean, only in the sense that you know, if you want to do an interconnected universe, um, you don't want to confuse people by having somebody play Batman on television live-action, then it's a different guy playing Batman with a different tone in live-action on the film. Um, you you kind of don't want to confuse your film goers. I, I don't. I think people though in general understand the difference between a film and a TV show. Though I don't. Um, I don't think people are that confused. If they're doing it for the purpose of creating a larger interconnected universe, I'm cool with that. Um, especially if you know you take something like Arrow, which I'm really digging, and somehow connect that to the Man of Steel universe. Like that's you know a part of that world. Uh, kind of what's going on with Shield right now and, and the greater Marvel universe. I, I like that kind of stuff, so I'm cool with that. You know, don't don't have different players um, playing those characters because you want your people to believe. Hey, when I'm watching my weekly television show, I'm getting a continuation of adventures in the universe that uh, I just saw in a theatrical release. Cool. So I don't know if that's the reason. Amazon I, that was always in development. You know, so I think you're right on the money. I think that the larger thing is there's Wonder Woman now that's going to be the Superman, Batman. They don't want to confuse the audiences with having this Amazon television show, which may or may not have the same tone as the Wonder Woman we're seeing in Superman, Batman. Um, and I, I think they want that to be the debut of Wonder Woman. I, I can imagine that being more important than like the Smallville Superman example that I used earlier. I think the definition of Superman is clearer to people. Than Wonder Woman, and I think that at least that's the concern of DC. Anytime that I hear her brought up at conventions, that tends to pop up a lot. That uh, people don't have as much of a rich understanding of Wonder Woman through the various different years and the various different versions of her that have gone on. Um, there, there's not, you know, what is that definitive Wonder Woman? And I think they're looking to create that. So I guess you know the assumption there would be. Let's not do this TV show. Or maybe the TV show is passed up on and has nothing to do with the film, but this is, would be my, my take on it. Let's really focus on this movie version of her and hopefully it'll lead into a film franchise. Um, I just want to see the character get some due because I think Wonder Woman's brilliant. I love the character. I don't care if they put her on the T. I, I see the greedy me wants her both. I want her in that Amazon show and I want her in the film. So that's me. And if there's variations on the version, who cares? The Smallville version was different than the Superman Returns version. I wasn't confused. <laughs> one was a TV show showcasing a much younger Clark, and one was a film otherwise. And Amazon, my understanding, was supposed to, it was supposed to be like you know, Wonder Woman Smallville. Yeah, that would be the way you would do that. And then you have a much older version in the film. You know? So I don't know. Um, that's just, I, I, don't really, I don't really have strong feelings one way or another on it. It kind of goes back to what I said earlier. Um, you know, if you axe a show and it's because you're trying to put a greater focus on this film version, make it great. That's all I care about. You know, let's uh, get do these characters justice and really showcase them to an, a casual audience that maybe doesn't know or forgot about the character. I think Wonder Woman uh, needs a resurgence. I think people need to know who this character is. I think she's a great character with a large mass market appeal. I've said on the show many times over the years, um, I take a look at games like God of War, and I'm sorry, you could take out Kratos and put Wonder Woman in there and be a great game. Um, you know, you'd have to make some story adjustments and all that, but if you read Wonder Woman comics, there really isn't a whole lot of story content that you would have to change uh, to make it a Wonder Woman game. When I talk about story content, I mean, you know, you wouldn't have to... Um, all ages the game all that much to make it a Wonder Woman game because Wonder Woman's con- 
comics right now and, and throughout her history have had uh, an edge to them. And I, I look at a game like that and I'm like, there's an audience there that if they understood Wonder Woman would really like the character. And it really is uh, the God of War crowd. I love those games. And uh, I just think they're tailor-made to be a great Wonder Woman game. And I think that's that's the audience you want to aim for when you're making her in movie appearances. It's it's that crowd. Um, I might be wrong, but I'd love to see that. So I don't know. We'll see. It's a good call. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the content. How's it going, Sean? How's it going, Jim? This is uh, Brandon calling on New Orleans. It's been a long time since you guys have gotten to hear from me. I actually uh, went through uh, some hard some hard times at home uh, with, with a little illness and, and kind of fell behind with my, my comic books. Was unable to. Uh, afford them over the last couple of months, but uh, I'm back in tip-top shape now, and all things are good, and uh, I actually just started to catch back up on all the comics. I, I missed your show so much throughout it, because I just couldn't listen to it, because of course, you know, I hadn't read the stories, and we all know if you haven't read the stories, you got to read the stories, so you can come back and better enjoy the show, and uh, I, I, right now, I'm, I'm listening to, I think it's 176. And I'm hearing a comment on the Batmobile that you guys were talking about. And, uh, you know, me, Batman guy, of course. So uh, one thing I have been able to do is keep up with news <laughs> on the Internet. And uh, I, the, the biggest rumor is that uh, Ben Affleck, the Batmobile that they are putting into place for Batman versus Superman, is going to be based off of uh, an older Cadillac design. Very sporty. Very cool. There's uh, there's. I found a picture online. I have to go back and find the site to kind of sit, maybe shoot you guys a link or something to it. But it uh, it, it, it's very very cool looking. If, if this is the concept design for it, I gotta say, I'm all on board. It's 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 com- a completely different take than the tumbler, which I'm excited for. I love the tumbler. I love the bat pod. Uh, yeah, I've talked about my son before. Uh, you know, it's Christmas. My mom actually got him a, uh, you know, he's going to be turning four next month. She got him a remote control bat pod. This thing is supposed to be for six-year-olds. And my son, at th- three and a half years old, has beat Lego Batman, by the way, and has now learned how to control this bat pod remote control because Batman is, of course, his favorite character like that. He's, but it, it's just, it's so cool to see the bat pod ride around the living room. The wheels light up. It even does the kick flip spin like it did the movie it's incredible but back to the subject at hand the new concept car it looks to be you know a totally different take more of a sporty take more you know i'm sure it's going to have some arsenal in it you know every batmobile has its arsenal in 89 batmobile included loved it you know so i'm I'm really interested to see the, the new take on this batmobile i'm excited about it uh, and with the stories, man, forever evil. God, I just caught up. I'm, I'm at number four now, and the stuff going on in the, the stories so incredible. I'm just I'm tripping out by all of this. This the souped up Superman, Ultraman on Kryptonite, and Wicked Owl Man, and of course, you know, as I feared that uh, four months ago, I think one of my last phone calls was being worried about Dick Grayson, and uh, um, it, it's looking like. It's not going to be around too much more after after all of this. At least not as Nightwing, and uh, that makes me very very sad because he's been a favorite of mine since I was you know a little bitty kid because I had to be the sidekick. So I'm, I'm going to miss Nightwing. Uh, I'm feeling it already. Maybe something happens and we 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 get our Nightwing still, but, but, but it looks like he's going to be gone away, and I'm going to miss him. But anyway, guys, it's uh it's good to be catching back up on the books. Good to be here in the show again. Keep up the great work. Missed you guys. It's good to be here and you again. It's funny. It's whether it's here on the show through voicemails or through things like the Facebook group, uh, you know, anywhere, you know, where we have an opportunity to have contact. When I don't see or hear from people, I start to wonder where they are too. Because we do become like a community of friends through this podcasting thing that we do. And, and, and I was, I'm glad to hear that you're doing better and would welcome back, especially from one bat fan to the other. I was totally geeking out when you were talking about your son with the remote control. I was like sitting here like, wow. You know, th- that would be me as a kid. I would I would love that. And I think it's great that uh, your son has an opportunity. Because that, to me, 
that's one of the joys of this medium, and it's why I like different versions of the character. I, I like that there's something out there for me that's edgier, that maybe is not appropriate for a little kid, but that there's different versions that are animated and, and I'm being put out there that are appropriate for all ages that I'm still enjoying as a longtime fan, but are appropriate for a younger audience because of the fact that you can have you know kids playing with the toys and stuff like that, and parents that are making decisions, you know, okay, I'm going to take my kid to this movie, it's a little bit edgy, but we're going to do this together, and we're going to talk about it, and I, I just think that there's something to that kind of community aspect of doing that with parents and kids that, um, I don't know, these kids, these, you know, these characters have always given me a, a source of joy and a sense of wonder since my childhood, so I'm glad that a new generation's getting that, especially when you're talking about Lego, be he beat Lego Batman, I'm like, yeah! <laughs> That's cool. Um, you know, fun games, fun opportunities for kids to have things that are accessible that I think is great about comics. Um, the Batmobile based on an old Cadillac. I love that. Um, I'm a big fan of the Tumblr, too, and the Batpod, obviously, because <laughs> a lot of my comments just now about the remote control version. But to me, if you're going to do this, you know, show us a new variation on the character. Um, you know, I think that's great. Uh, Batman's very adaptable. And, you know, having the Ben Affleck version obviously harken back to what maybe we've seen in the most recent movies, but at the same time evolving the character. And do that through the vehicle, too. You know, show us that he's something different through that. The Batmobile has something that's continually evolved over time. It should be something that should wow you. It should make you go, oh, man, that's cool. I want to drive that. And to use the Tumblr again, would to me if they tried to go that route, would be disappointing. Because I, when I first saw the Tumblr, I loved it. And in each movie, when they, you know, made a, uh, you know, the bat, the, the, the bat itself, which was, you know, the new version of uh, his, his bat wing, I guess, for all extents and purposes, um, and the bat pod and all of that, that was all great. Every bit of that wowed me. I want to be wowed again. So I, I think that's great. I'm glad that they're going back to the drawing board and bringing in some of the classic while at the same time modernizing it somehow. Um, the, the Batmobile has that ability, and it's an iconic vehicle and should have that. So I think that, to, to me, is going to be awesome. I'm glad you're digging Forever Evil as well. I'm just thrilled that you're back. I, you know, I've had times where I've had to, throughout my life, pare down to just a single title. And uh, you know, just because my budget... You know, didn't allow for it, and it's funny when when the opportunity presents itself again to start reading more titles. How there's an, a certain sense of excitement, especially when I can have three, four, or five issues of something. Maybe I have the opportunity to catch up on, or maybe I'm reading the current issue and doing what you're doing. You know, maybe kind of going on the internet and keeping up with the news of what's going on with certain characters. Nightwing. I don't think Nightwing's going to be gone. I, he might not be called Nightwing. I don't know what that's going to play out as. But I think this is an opportunity to do something with Dick Grayson and continue to evolve him. He's another character that evolves very well. Um, my catch is they really need to take a good, long look at what Kyle Higgins just did with this character and need to keep it in mind with whatever they do with him moving forward. They really, really do. Because that Kyle Higgins series has really been a case study on what works with Nightwing. He, Kyle Higgins is clearly a fan of everything that's been good about Dick Grayson throughout the entire tenure the character's been used. And I would like to see somebody, whoever is attached to the character, do something similar. I, I just, that, that he needs to have his own title. And uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm right that they, you know, aren't doing something horrible to him um, where we won't see the character anymore. Uh, he would be a mistake to take off of the, sh off of the table altogether. Uh, I think it's far more interesting to see him have to react to what happened to him through this. That's just my take on it. Hi, this is Jack, and I want to agree that Jim Calafuri's work is fantastic. I loved him on Secret Six. I'm definitely going to get Leaving Megalopolis, and uh, I want to thank him because he gave me one of the best posters I have ever had. He did a miniseries called Gotham Underworld with... Uh, Penguin and Riddler, and uh, basically it was a lot running alongside the Salvation Run. You guys talked about it, and you guys liked it pretty much as much as I did. Um, but Calafuri did, or DC released anyway, a poster of that picture he did with all the Batman villains, kind of from a worm's eye view, and they're all going up the side of the building. It is so awesome. It is also 
for those of you who are interested in checking out this mini series, which is a great mini series, and you should, um, didn't start trades that uh, those guys that sponsor this show. You could get the uh, Underworld Gotham Underworld trade paperback for half price on in stock trades. So anyway, thanks guys. Great to hear from Jim Cal Fury, and uh, talk to you guys later. Bye. He was at one of the comic conventions before we knew him from the podcast. Um, he had a preview of it. It was before the book was actually being released, and what he had was a preview of those covers that he was showcasing. And oh my gosh, was that breathtaking! It's Gotham Underground is the series that you're talking about, and Frank Thierry, and excuse me if I'm butchering his name, um, was the one who did the writing on it. And it was it was a really really cool series. The great part about it is. It featured really a who's who in the Gotham universe, and it's a very contained miniseries. So if you haven't had a chance to uh, to read it, uh, it's definitely one well worth seeking out. And like you mentioned, it's on Instruct Trades. So I'm glad you shouted it out. I, I, I was smiling because you're right, it's a great series, and the artwork is spectacular. It's great to see an artist have an opportunity in a miniseries like that to be able to explore the landscape of a character like Batman and his villains, you know, and, and the whole, really the whole unit, the whole Batman universe at the time, um, he had a chance to do something with. So it, it was really cool and well done. So uh, thanks for shouting that one out. Um, he, it was, it's always great to have him on the show. How's it going guys? Sean Jim. This is uh Brandon calling out out of new Orleans again. Uh, just calling today to talk about a little, uh, well, movie and TV actually, uh, as I'm sure all of you have heard, the big uh, casting news has been done. Uh, I think it's Jesse Eisenberg, if I'm not so mistaken. Uh, we would know him from The Social Network and preferably one of my favorite movies of all time, Zombieland. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen it, but uh, it's kind of a goofy take on the zombie apocalypse with Woody Harrelson. And uh, the actress's name is escaping me. She plays Gwen, Emma Stone, Gwen Stacy in The Amazing Spider-Man. Great great movie hilarious uh and you know that role in the movie is one of the reasons why there's such hesitation behind this casting that i'm hearing again of course this is the third big casting news in this uh this movie and all of them have been uh met with trepidation ben affleck of course who i thought would have i would have been most you know cautious about and actually most excited to see what he can do Gail Gadot, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm still on the fence. Uh, I'm more cautious about her, uh, but hopefully, you know, we, we see otherwise. Uh, and, of course, this one, which people are, you know, cautious for this one because he's, he's been known for kind of that dorky, you know, shy, behind-the-scenes role. But, you know, if, if you've seen his movies like Zombieland and you've seen uh, movies like uh, Social Network, you'll see that he's got a lot of range. I mean, a broad, broad range. And if uh, if you shave his head, he's kind of got the look. I'd say another 15 pounds of muscle, which, of course, is possible. I mean, look at Christian Bale from The Machinist to Batman Begins, or Tom Hardy as of recently with Bane. You know, the guy was, he was scrawny, and he pulled off Bane quite well. So, anyway, uh, and then Jeremy Irons as Alfred is the, the other one. This one, I... I I don't know. I'm weird about this one, but I can see it working. So uh, let me know what you guys think. And uh, I'll talk, oh, pardon me. I'll talk with you later. Jeremy Irons is a terrific actor. I, I mean, is it like, would I have necessarily done that casting right away? Well, I, I, I was going to say no, but the truth of the matter is Jerry Irons, uh, Jeremy Irons knocked on my door and said, Hey, I heard you're doing a Batman movie. I'd love to be your Alfred. I would be like drooling. Yeah. Cause I love Jeremy Irons. So I take that back. I wouldn't do it in an instant. I, I don't know. I, I think I, I'm just, I'm looking at it this way. We're looking at a movie right now. Where we've got our Superman cast. We've got our Batman cast. We've got our Wonder Woman cast. We've got our Alfred cast, Lex Luthor's cast. These are characters we want to see in this film. And that means this, project moving forward. I mean, for so long, we've been sitting here saying we want to start seeing these characters on the screen. What amazes me is, I can understand people be having a little trepidation. There's a difference between trepidation and kind of going, ah, oh, kind of want to wait and see and all that kind of stuff. That's something that excitement can build off of. What really bothers me is the amount of animosity people are sharing out there. And these are the same people that were screaming for the longest time, let's get this movie going. Well, now it's going and you want it to fail. I, I don't get it. It's really bizarre to me. Uh, it, it's interesting casting, um, and, and it's clear that they've got a plan in place. Um, they're 
they're casting unique people with a diverse range. Um, so you're missing you're Jesse Eisenberg um, as Lex Luthor. It's it's unique casting. Um, I in the movies you're mentioning, Zombieland and Social Network, he was brilliant. Um, two very different movies. Uh, I mean, two very different roles for him. So I don't know. I'd like to see this kid do it. Uh, you know, more power to him. Show me Lex Luthor. Show me, you know, what you can do with him. Do something different than what we've seen with the character in the past, but stick to the core of who Lex Luthor is. Uh, we got to remember, we got the writers on this film that we want. Uh, and there's a script in place that we want. And, you know, directors that are going to be involved in this that, you know, I, I loved Man of Steel. So... Uh, coming off of that, having that talent behind the scenes running this film, I got a lot of faith. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's going to be a Wonder Woman in this film. I mean, uh, how cool is that? They cast her for a reason. I want to see what it is. Show me. I, 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 my attitude at this point is I would love to see every one of these actors and actresses prove them wrong. Prove them wrong. <laughs> I want it to be good, um, so I'm I'm rooting for it. Uh, it's unique. It's unique casting. Um, I don't know. See, it was funny when Michael Caine was originally cast as Alfred. Uh, I've watched Michael Caine for years. I think he's a brilliant actor. I, I was kind of like, I think that's sometimes the danger when you've seen people in other product. You look at them and kind of go, I don't know if I could see him in that role because you maybe haven't seen them in that role before. So it's sometimes a danger of doing that. But then when you pick somebody like that who has the chops for it, they're going to surprise you and show you something different, especially if they take it seriously. I think we are in a great era where these movies are not just taken as, oh, I'm doing that comic book film, um, which I think is great. You know, these movies are starting to get acclaimed. People are starting to get notice from them. We're seeing big names associated with them. Lots of buzz, lots of dollars going towards them. So it's not like the, the black sheep of the Hollywood studio to be in a comic book film anymore. So I think because of that, you're starting to see names that you wouldn't normally expect associated with these movies. And I think it's for the better. I think we're seeing great product. I want this movie to succeed. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, more power to them. Hats off. Keep the casting coming. Let's see more characters. You know, where, what are we going to do? Uh, my hope is that the characters and the script match an appropriate pace for the film that's being presented. I don't need to be over inundated with characters. Like I love that Wonder Woman's going to be in it. I think that's really really cool. What I really want to see is a great Superman Batman movie. You know, so her role in that, as long as it doesn't detract from that in any way, great. I want to see some further development of Superman and Lois in this one. So I'm hoping there's time for that and Perry and the Daily Planet and so I don't want to see them overdo it. Uh, what I'd like to see is the building of a DC franchise that continues on into other movies, which I largely suspect is what's going on here. I think we're seeing um, continued casting that's going to lead to another Batman movie eventually. It's going to lead to a Justice League movie. It's going to lead to hopefully a Wonder Woman movie. Those are things I all want to see. So, yay. So I'm, I'm largely suspecting a lot of the casting choices they're making are not just for their singular film. They're looking at a long-term direction. So they're making careful choices with people that they think can lead them into the future of these franchises. So I'm excited. I like that that kind of plans in place. It's not just about one movie. It's about building something. Uh, build it and let's, let's see where it goes. I'm excited for that. Us to place a small sign in your yard. We will install a new security system at absolutely no cost to you whatsoever. There is no cost for the system or the installation whatsoever. To hear more, press 1 now. To be placed on our Do Not Call list, press 9. This was on our show Skype voicemail line, and I, I was going to delete it, and I'm strangely fascinated by it, because if we're a podcast, do we technically have a yard? I don't know. I guess it would be my yard. <laughs> Um, but ooh. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I don't know why I put it on there. I put it on cause actually I know why I put it on cause it's silly. It's very silly. So <laughs> consider that our commercial break, our, our non-paid commercial break. Hey fellas, this is, uh, Dennis from, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, just calling in with, uh, with a little bit of a quandary. We've been listening to the, 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 the podcast there and going over the, uh, the, uh, Justice League War. Uh, synopsis and your thoughts and views on it. Agree with it wholeheartedly. I absolutely loved it. Um, you guys like majorly hit on all the high points and picked up on pretty much everything that that, that I loved about it. Um, did have one one little sticking point though, and it, 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 it's you know probably just me being you know, a, a little loose on something. Maybe I maybe I missed something that's obvious and I haven't 
went and uh, read uh, Flashpoint in a while. But uh, at the end of Flashpoint, when the timeline had been changed, and, you know, Barry came back, things had been set, kind of set the new 52 in motion, uh, he gives Batman a letter. And at that point, it's established that they know each other. However, when Justice League War picks up, they don't know each other. And that's just something that kind of was like, I don't know, it was a bit of a head-scratcher. I'm trying to figure out what I missed when I read it that, that I uh, maybe, uh, I don't know. So anyhow, I'm trying to piece it together. I'll probably go back and do some reading, but I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on it and see what, uh, see what you guys had to learn to the, the mystery at hand. Anyhow, love the show, guys. Keep up the good work, and uh, I'll keep on listening. Have a great night. Bye. Timeline-wise for Flashpoint, I never took it that Flashpoint happened before Justice League War. Justice League War was the origin story of the Justice League. It takes place before, like, for example, if you're reading Batman at the same month that Justice League started being released, or next month, I should say, um, you know, as they started going into the New 52, Batman already was operating and was years later from Justice League. So that was the origin story of the Justice League when they first met, when they first started teaming up. Kind of like how Action Comics was taking place in Superman's early origin. So that was the past. Flashpoint, I took that to be an event that happened to Barry. And because of the whole time shift, Barry probably doesn't remember. Because I think there was stuff, and, and forgive me, I haven't read Flashpoint either in a long time. So I'm with you on that end. But I thought that Barry was alluding to the fact that because of what happened to him and, and the trauma of, you know, the, the changing thing and him being in the middle of it and all that, he wasn't going to remember all the details of everything that happened to him through that process. And, and the new status quo would bleed over for him as well. But that would be something where this is a Bruce and Barry that already were on the Justice League together. So that happened at some point in time in Flash's career, in Bruce's career, that hasn't really been defined in the New 52 one that happened. I don't know when, if we're going to ever get that story as, as far as, you know, like this happened between issue number 12 and issue number 13 of Flash. I don't think we're ever going to necessarily get that spelled out. I don't know that we need it, but I do not take that as happening before war. So, and I don't know if other people agree with me or not. Um, but you're right. They clearly knew each other. And I took that to be a Bruce and Barry that had already been operating at that point in time. They'd already been on the justice league. They've been operating for a few years. Uh, it didn't take place in the same time. There were things that could have happened before the event of flash coming out of there to that whole world. And there were characters already operating that had been, you know, so this happened at some point in time in that present continuity. And the stuff that happened in Justice League with the reboot there and in Action Comics with the reboot there, Zero Year that's going on with Batman right now takes place well before what happened in Flashpoint. So that's kind of how I took it continuity-wise. I would love to see that. I don't, I, sometimes you paint yourself into a corner if you start like saying it happened between these certain issues. So I don't know that they necessarily really do need to spell that out, but at least that's the way I took it, and that's the only way that it works for me. Because otherwise, you're right, we got a huge conundrum with the two of them meeting there. Um, because the relationship when he comes out of there with Bruce is one of a strong familiarity, and there's no way that familiarity fits for where they were at in Justice League War. It has to be something that happened later with them. So, And I would imagine with the way things like that works and what happened with Pandora that it actually is more likely to run concurrently with when we start seeing Pandora pop on the scene in the DC universe. You know, this is like, you know, her reaction to all of this. I don't know. Uh, let's see what happens as we go. If, you know, if there is any reference to that, I largely suspect we're not going to get a whole lot of that. The point of that series was really to show why the universe changed and to give us a connecting point. And as for, instead of spelling it out as being a specific event that the world would be aware of, because nobody is really aware that that happened. Other than Flash went on an adventure, he came back, he had something to give to Bruce. Flash, I don't know, could really speak on what happened to him. Uh, because of how that whole timey stuff works. And I kind of like that. I kind of like the fact that sometimes time folds back together. And in Barry's mind, the adventure probably looks different to Barry than it did to us as the reader. Barry, probably his mind has forced him to resolve that in a way 
that looks very different than how we understand it as a reader because we were connected to the old universe. We saw how it all changed. In Barry's case, he was a part of this universe, had the adventures in Flashpoint and came back. He's probably not aware of what happened. That's, that's kind of how that kind of stuff works because it's now this universe is Barry, which makes your head hurt. Um, but I love time travel stuff because of the fact that things like that happen where your head hurts. But I don't consider what you're saying. I don't think that's a conundrum of it. I think it, the Flashpoint happened after Justice League War. That's just me. If people disagree, call in or you know post in our Facebook group. I'd love to hear people's thoughts. Where do you think Flashpoint happened? Do you think Flashpoint happened in a specific point in time, or it's just this? Uh, there's an ambiguity to where it happened in the New Fifty Two for the two characters. So. Hey guys, it's Anthony. It's been a while since I've uh, left the question here, and I wanted to talk about two quick things. Usually I go on and on, but um, here's the thing. Um, I want to thank you guys for, again, getting me hooked on something, kind of pushing me to purchase it. Um, you guys have gotten me hooked on Fracture. You guys got me hooked on uh, on the Valiant books. Um, I, recently, I watched Arrow because of you and my friends. You know, all kinds of cool stuff. Well, this, just today in the mail, thanks to your advertisement last week, I finally got the push to check out a series I was curious about, but never had the chance to. And it's because you guys advertised it, and that's planetary i was i just got my planetary on on the bus today and wow that's the first issue and i'm hooked i may have to drop some of my other comic books so i want to thank you guys for that the second question is uh my friends and i have started a uh a podcast and it's not up yet but um what i wanted to know from one podcast to another i i do another podcast uh, with a friend of mine on gaming um Called social links were part of the Gamer Horizon website, but I, I wanted to ask you guys more about the behind the scenes stuff because usually, you know, we ask about you, you know comic books or opinions on comic books, that type of thing. So I wanted to ask you guys, you know, how many mics do you use? Do you you and Jim use one mic? Do you both use separate mics? What editing software you guys use? You know, how long does it take to record and put together an average episode? You know, with combined times. Stuff like that. Just just very curious about the process that you guys do, the behind-the-scenes stuff. Um, you know, do you sometimes you Skype to record if Jim can't make it over, you know, that type of stuff. Because I'm very curious. I, I'm very interested in those things. And how long does it take, like, to edit? And just, just very curious. I think uh, now that I'm editing, learning how to edit a podcast, it's fascinating. It's very, very cool. So... So there you go. And also, as always, uh, really enjoying Forever Evil, you know, the current DC stuff. So there you go. Um, is there anything else I wanted to talk to you about? Um, hmm. Oh, just real quick. Um, what what are, um, outside of Justice League Unlimited, what are some of your more memorable moments from that TV show? That'll be all. Thank you, guys. And you guys take care. Awesome podcast, as always. Take care. Goodbye. First of all, congratulations on discovering Planetary. The great thing about the Planetary Omnibus, if anybody hasn't read it, it's contained. You get all of the Planetary stuff in there. It's amazing. It's Warren Ellis, John Cassidy's artwork, uh, colors by friend of the show David Barron. Laura Martin, I think, does some color work on there as well. It's gorgeous, gorgeous from start to finish. And that's the great thing about it. It's, it's one of those omnibuses that really collects the whole thing. And I can't give it a high enough recommendation. It's just really quality work. And it's really a cool one, too, because you grab it and like that whole volume is all of it. So you can really just kind of dive into and enjoy the whole experience. Uh, he was mentioning podcasting. And, and uh, it's really evolved a great deal for Jim and myself. We've been doing this for – it'll be eight years in March. You know, life sometimes makes choices for you where when we first started, Skype was – in I don't want to say in its infancy, but it wasn't where it is now, and internet connections weren't where they are now. So it's funny how in eight years, you know, when we originally started this, we started with uh, I still actually I'm still using it. It's a Behringer uh, Euro Rack uh, mixer that I've been using. Uh, we call it the Beast, um, just because it just uh, oh actually Old Faithful. Um, we have another one called the Beast. It's a much larger one that we ended up purchasing. And I ended up going back to the smaller one that we started with uh, quite a while ago just because I just feel like it's a better sound and uh, just it, it, it's old faithful. It works great and we've had it since uh, we started podcasting. And uh, I have Shure SM58 mics that we used to use. The one that I have now 
is a Shure SM27, and I went to that one because it looks more like a radio studio mic. And I'm going to be 100% honest with you, it's just because of the visual look that I went to this one. I, I have it on a boom arm, and uh, it, it like hangs over my computer like it's a radio mic. So uh, I, I like the fact that I can swing the boom arm from one side to the other when I'm not podcasting. And uh, when I am, it feels like I'm in a radio studio. So it's kind of a geeky thing, you know, with the fact that we've been doing this for so long to just have a setup like that. That's something I've always wanted. Jim and I used to record in this room. It's, it's a little office in my house that I use. And uh, I still have the setup there for Jim. But Jim moved uh, quite a distance. When I say quite a distance, I mean he can still drive over here. But for him, it would amount to uh, about a 45-minute drive every time we wanted to record. And with Skype where it's at now, there's been no reason. We haven't actually recorded in studio in about two years. Uh, just because of the fact that, you know, with his move and his work schedule and mine, it was much easier just to start doing it via Skype. So he has his own setup now, and we record via Skype, and I couldn't really speak to what his setup is, other than I know he uses just a basic USB mic with a, uh, you know, windscreen on it. So uh, we were both big fans of a windscreen to make sure it kind of takes away from the, the pops of the P's and the, you know, sound of the S's that you get in there. So, um that's that's kind of our setup. Um, as far as recording goes, recording is usually for us at this stage, just because we walk in with a game plan, it's usually about a half an hour longer than what our actual podcast is. That doesn't include things like this, like listener voicemails or um, the ads. I usually put those in after the fact. Um, it depends. You know, if, if we have time, we do the voicemails together. If we don't, I do them gradually during the week just because you know, I want to make sure to have that content on there because I think uh, listeners are a valuable voice on the show. And it's, it's kind of fun for me during the week to kind of just take one or two here and there and put them together. Editing takes quite a bit of time. Um, it, not anywhere near what it used to take. I used to take out every um, ah, uh, and you know. Uh, I used to spend hours and hours doing that. The reality is that something has to give at some point in time. So I've gotten much more judicious. Uh, I take out every pause you know, we don't have a lot of long pauses in the show. There's times where you're collecting your thoughts and you'll naturally pause and there'll be a space. And I go through and I take all of those out because my belief is for people listening to this, um, for any podcast, that's just kind of a personal thing of mine. You don't want anybody to have dead air. You know, that they, you want people to keep moving and feel like that what they're listening to is continually moving. Their time is valuable. They're taking time out of their schedule to listen to content, not nothing. <laughs> so if, if I really am cautious about taking out pauses because those will quickly eat up the time. Uh, I, I am pretty good at seeing things like ums and excessive ands and so's and those long things. I don't take out every single one of them, but as I'm going through and I see them, I take out as many as I can. Uh, you can see them visually as you're going through. It, it takes usually double the time of the recording for me to edit it. So, you know, if it's a if it's a 2-hour podcast, it takes me about 4 hours to edit. If it's a 3-hour uh, podcast, it takes me about 6 hours to edit. Um, give or take, you know, sometimes uh, that'll go a little quicker. Sometimes it'll take a little longer. If I'm doing an interview with a guest, that takes longer to edit cuz I tend to be I go back into the old me mode, the one that uh, used to take out every little tiny thing, and I tend to do that whenever we have a guest, especially when they're speaking. I try to clean up anything that because I feel that they're representing their work, they've given their time. So those episodes take quite a bit longer for me to do when I edit them. We're not an interview show, so uh, I tend to feel like those are special events when we have those people on, uh, and I want those to be something that they felt like, especially because we tend to be longer for them as well. I, I want them to feel like that was time well spent and they were re well represented. So that's kind of how we work behind the scenes. And it doesn't necessarily work for every podcast. If you do a shorter podcast, uh, you know, you're, you're able to spend times doing different things that maybe we don't, but that's kind of what it looks like behind the scenes. Thanks for asking that actually. Um, it's, it's a lot of work on my end that I like. It's like putting together a puzzle. At this point in time, with 381 shows, I've been I've edited all of them, and uh, I it's my baby on that end. And that's not taking anything away from Jim's role in the show. It's more of a it was my idea to start a podcast. Jim was the gracious friend that was kind enough to jump on board this ride 
and he's given so much of his time to it when it was originally intended to be a rotating guest. <laughs> um, Jim embraced it, and he's been that guy that's been there. But you you adopt roles very quickly that you become your own. And uh, with me, it's I've put together right or wrong. I'm not saying they've been perfect. Um, I've made mistakes along the way with editing. I've done things right. I've done things wrong. I've learned a lot along the way. I've got a system that seems to work for me for doing it. And uh, it's very therapeutic uh, for anybody that's thinking about podcasting. If you're wondering about doing it, uh, I would say dive at it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's like putting together a puzzle. And when you're done, you feel like you've, cre- you've got a creative product that you can be very proud of. I hope that answers that question. That was a good question you know, from one pod- podcaster to another. I think it looks different for each person and for each podcast because you're going to structure it differently. That's what works for our show. And majority of the recordings, like I said, are through Skype now, just because that just ends up working out best for us. My work schedule, I have a, very, I have a new job position that I've been in for the last year. And my time is, I've got stuff that I'm doing for my job at home every night. So I've got to be very conscientious of my work responsibilities first, then the podcast comes after that. So there's a lot of nights where I'll do a whole bunch of things from work and then I'll do a half an hour here, a half an hour there working on the podcast, you know, as I get free time when I'm done with that. So it might be a half an hour this night. It might be an hour this night until the podcast is done. It's a lot of the reasons why if for people that follow what's going on behind the scenes of the show, you'll see me post on the website. Hey, here's the status. Here's where we're at. Um, it really is based on where my work schedule's at, I'm then able to jump and dive into this and, and get the product out to you. So that's that's kind of how it works on our end. That's cool. It's a good question. You talked about Justice League Unlimited. For me, what really grabbed me about Justice League Unlimited, the Hawkman episodes were great, where they were kind of mirroring what was going on in JSA. We got to see Hawkman and Hawk Girl together. I geeked out over that. But really, taking it away from individual characters or specific episodes... What I really loved when it started hitting that Justice League Unlimited phase was the vast wealth of DC characters that we got to see on screen. Usually, up till then, when we saw a program, it was really back in the Super Friends days, the challenge of the Super Friends days, was the first time we started seeing a whole bunch of characters on a program. We hadn't seen a whole lot of that since then. We got to see Batman's animated series, Superman's animated series, and they were fantastic, not taking anything away from them. You'd see guest appearances from characters, but never like multiple episodes where you'd start to see like just like, you know, Adam Smasher, for example, from JSA was appearing on Justice League Unlimited. I'm like, this is incredible. This is cool. There were so many who's who of the DC universe that was appearing on that show. And then in the comic book that went along with it. I mean, it's just terrific stuff. So that was what really I was geeking out from. It was seeing more and more characters appear on the show, then more and more characters being spotlighted on the show through their interactions with the main characters that had been on since the beginning, when it was just the smaller Justice League team in the first couple seasons. So I liked that aspect as it went to Unlimited. We got to see more and more of the DC Universe represented and represented well. And I think it's a prelude for all those those of us that are fans, to seeing more of those characters now appearing in film and on TV and the, and the nod references that we get on shows like Arrow and things like that. I don't know. Justice League Unlimited really was cutting edge, and I think it holds up extremely well. If you've never seen that cartoon, do yourself a favor because it's really top-quality animation with great stories. It's a prelude also to the direct-to-DVD releases that we're seeing now. It's that type of animation quality. And it had a lot of ongoing story arcs. There were things that were going on behind the scenes that you got to follow that I'm a big fan of when they do that in animation. So I don't have specific favorite episodes other than I'm a huge Hawkman fan. And when they do them right, which you, to see him in mass media, multimedia, I should say, done right is very rare. You know, where you get to see him like, wow, that's really a great representation of him. Justice League Unlimited did him right. The episodes they did with him featuring Hot Girl, and they had stuff going on with Jon Stewart in that at the time. I just thought that stuff was really fantastic. It was really top quality animation. And I would say that for any fan of any particular character, if your character was featured on that show, you were geeking out because it was featured right. So um, that was the cool part. That was the cool part. They also had um, the really good one with uh, Black Canary, 
they did like a Birds of Prey-ish episode on there. I really loved that. Uh, I don't know. There's, there's so many really good episodes. I, I'm hard pressed to pick one. Uh, it was really an overall experience. So much comic talent was involved, and that's a key as well in the writing of those shows. It showed, and I think that's the reason why it was so right. They were they really brought the sensibilities of what we like to read into the program, and I think it's just because the people behind the scenes understood comics. The people writing, because they were a lot of them were comic writers, understood comics. This material just works really well in a variety of mediums, and uh, the, the comic book storytelling does not get the credit it's due. And I think shows like that really showcase it. I do want to shout out our show voicemail line. It's one four four zero three eight eight. 4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. I actually spent a lot of time tonight uh, going through and, and doing like a voicemail catch up. So we're current with all of our voicemails as of this. Our last one was actually on February 14th. So please feel free to call in the show with any of your thoughts, ideas, concepts, questioning things that we've talked about, adding new ideas, or even bringing up things maybe we haven't discussed in a while, books that you want to spotlight. You know, in the time the frame that we have for the show where there's so much that we aren't able to get to that we'd love to that uh, please feel free to shout out titles that you feel aren't getting enough notice on our podcast and uh, do your own uh, two cents worth on them because I would love to have that on there as well anything you want to discuss is always welcome I consider this a community part of the show the voicemails it's the reason why I firmly believe in airing all of them um, because I believe your voice and your thoughts are far more important in those segments than even anything that I have to say so I think it's really great when we have that so thank you for everyone that took the time to call in um, those voicemails are definitely valued by me holy caffeine Sponsoring our show is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com over at DCBService.com. Don't forget that February 2014 DC bundle. Collect all of the new titles from DC, Batman Eternal, Secret Origins, Aquaman and the Others, Sinestro, and Justice League United. $17.95 regularly, 50% off, only $8.97 for pre-ordering it. The great part about DCB service when they do these, they usually continue these deals more than one month, so that way you have an opportunity to pre-order them at the discount all the way through to see if you want to get all the titles or just some of them moving forward. So it's a great opportunity to do a savings for a few months trying to decide which titles are right for your pull list if you want to get one of them two of them all of them over at instocktrades.com do not forget that planetary omnibus i cannot give this a higher possible recommendation if you've never read these books do yourself a favor you've missed out 864 pages and it collects all of it it's one handy volume that just grabs you. It's the ti- it's hailed as the timeless story that turned the modern superhero conventions on their heads. Planetary stars an interdimensional peacekeeping force including Elijah Stone, Chiquita Wagner, and the drummer. Tasked with tracking down evidence of superhuman activity, these mystery archaeologists uncover unknown paranormal secrets and histories such as a World War II supercomputer that can access other universes, a ghostly spirit of vengeance, and a long-lost island of dying monsters. Now the entire series is collected in hardcover. It collects Planetary 1 to 27, Planetary Batman number 1, Planetary JLA number 1, and Planetary Authority number 1. It's a great opportunity to just get all of that in one handy volume. So I can't give it a higher enough recommendation. Remember that InStockTrades.com does free shipping on orders of $50 or more. It's just another way to save on their already amazing deals. So I want to thank DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com for supporting our show. I want to quickly remind everyone about our show website, RagingBullets.com. That's the place to find out news about the podcast. Um, If you tried it a couple of days this week and it was down, um, I got the podcast back up and everything like that. I just had to do a renewal on our hosting, and for some reason it didn't go through the first time. We're all set and ready to go on there. If you're still getting that message, just clear your cache and it'll be back up again. I'm actually moving it through uh, our podcast server provider to a different server. It'll actually be a faster server, which in the end will make it uh, more stable for the future. So there's going to be a time this coming month where it might be down for a day or two. If you see that, don't worry. The podcast hasn't gone anywhere and the website certainly hasn't. It's just me moving it to a new server. So that way uh, we get even more reliable service than what we've gotten previously from it. So just wanted to give everyone a heads up. The website is really the place to go for news on the show. I use it as a blog to give people updates on what's going on with the podcast, where we're thinking about heading with episodes, any news and info. I have it directly linked to our Twitter account, which bumps it to our Raging Bullets Facebook page. Speaking of Facebook, though, we have an amazing Facebook group community that's 
so far beyond the podcast. Um, it's attended by fellow podcasters who post updates on where their podcasts are going, and I really encourage people to do that. Please, it's a community that's beyond the show. If you have a blog, post out there. If you have a comic that you're doing, Kickstarters you're involved in, whatever. Um, if you want to post about anything geek-related, it's really, I look at it as a safe community where we can geek out and really just have fun talking about topics that interest us without the snark. Um, that's one of the great things I love about the community. There's just a wonderful group of people that participate there, and it's all about just having great geeky discussions about pop culture. And uh, it's going beyond the show, and I thank everyone who participates there because uh, it really is the quality of the people that post there that make it such a great community. So thank you for everyone. Whether you come by casually or you're there all the time, you're all a part of what that community is, and it's and uh, it's really just great to see. So thank you for everyone on that. We're also available on Google Plus. We have a Google Plus page, um, and we have personal pages as well. Feel free to add me on any of those sites. Um, I participate the most on Facebook um, and Twitter, um, so please feel free to add me on both of those. I'm starting to participate more on Google Plus. Uh, with obviously with the show and my job and everything like that, I'm trying to participate in as many pages, places as I can, and I just greatly appreciate all the support that we get from you guys outside, because you guys shout out podcasts, you guys let people know about us in social media. Uh, it's really a labor of love for all of us, and and you guys being the ambassadors of what we do. And when I say we, I'm talking about podcasts in general. I'm speaking on behalf of all of them. If you, whether you listen to our show, uh, multiple shows. You know, we might be the first on your list. We might be the last on your list. It doesn't matter. I appreciate being on your list. Any time you take to shout us out to other people and let people know, hey, on some level, you find us enjoyable, really helps draw people to our podcast. So thank you for that as well. I'm, I'm greatly um, humbled by the fan community that really supports our show and other podcasts. Uh, that's one of the great things about it. I look at our show as more like a fanzine. And uh, it's it's you guys that really bring people to us, and, and I thank you for that. Our next episode I want to shout out, uh, we're going to be discussing Harley Quinn, Joker's Daughter, the events that have been happening in Justice League of America, Justice League, and the Justice League of Dark line. And when I say the line, you know, it's things like in Constantine, um, Pandora, and Phantom Stranger. It's that Blight storyline. Um, we're going to be discussing the most recent issue, Constantine number 11, but obviously we'll discuss the events that led up to um, issue number 11. So it'll be the most current issues of all of those books. Just to get you up to speed on the things that are happening a little bit outside of Forever Evil, because we haven't had a chance to talk about them in a while. So we got a very packed show, and we will see you next week. Bye! Space and time, a thousand different lifetimes. Faded for love and loss, and incredibly clear sidelines. Swinging your mace around, such a practical loud look. Helping the JSA and occasionally supporting your own book. Hawk man, hawk man, eagle eyes can't see. Hawk man, your plan. Then in guard or Egyptian Working so hard to thwart You and Hawker's mission The odds are not on your side And danger seems to stack up Things would be so much easier If you would just call for backup Hawkman, Hawkman Eagle eyes can't see Can't see.